My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Can we just be silent for a second? And just allow that weight to rest upon you. Just stay silent. Don't worry. Our responses will be different. Somebody will start groaning in the spirit. The Holy Ghost will fall upon him like a weight. He will start groaning. This is how men are formed. He will start groaning in the spirit. It's a weight. I sense it in the spirit. And I ask that that weight rest upon you. Let it rest upon you. Capacities are being enlarged. Capacity, capacity. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. Mm. We give you glory. We give you glory. I'm seeing the Lord open the eyes of people. Men that see voices that prophesy to the nations. You may not look like it, but it's the hand of God. And it comes upon you tonight to activate your ordination. By the spirit of the living God, receive that impartation. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you glory. Take all the honor. Take all the honor. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Please, this is not about sound. That's why I ask them to shut it down. Some of us are used to certain kinds of music. It's not about sound. It's not about your emotion. It's an operation of the spirit. It's an organic operation. Yes, Father. Take all the grace. Take all the glory. Take all the glory. Take all the glory. We bless you for grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Yeshua. Hamashiach, Lion of Judah, Agune Chemba, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Lion of Judah, Agune Chemba, Yeshua. Lion of Judah, Agune Jemba, Yeshua, Yeshua, Amashia, Lion of Judah, Agune Jemba.
Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. We bless your name. Take all the praise. In Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. God bless you. Just sustain the decorum. That's, that's not necessary. Thank you. Praise the Lord. We're told that people came here on Tuesday and didn't meet us here and um, they felt we had relocated. Although we made the announcement, but we made it late. Um, we'll be here on Sundays and on Tuesdays to dig into the word and to trust God for an outpouring. Praise the name of the Lord. This evening, I just want to do a brief teaching. When you start building a people, it's always important to begin with the word. The word is the sure foundation. Usually, when you come into a place, people want to interact with you from the strength of the dimension they know you command. And if you are not careful, you raise the people that are interested in gifts and will not be established in the word of God. And so for the next two, three services, we'll just be opening scriptures, opening scriptures. So we learn to appreciate the word of God. Afterwards, we'll begin to delve into different quarters in the spirit. Hallelujah. But before I begin tonight, just to welcome my brother and a few persons, can we celebrate Apostle Lawa and his wife? Thank you for coming. The Lord bless you richly. Thank you so much. Thank you for brotherhood. My friend Pastor Richard is here. Thank you for coming. And of course, every other person that is here to have to share fellowship with us, the Lord bless you. The Lord increase you. Can we please celebrate God's servant, Minister Moses Akko? I think every Sunday that you are around, you'll be here to minister. You know, while he was ministering, I was just weeping. I was just weeping. Because there are certain things you can't communicate. You just experience it. You just flow in it. Sometimes when you start talking, you begin to distract yourself. Sometimes when you start talking, you begin to delve out of God's presence. I was just weeping and I just left myself in God's arms. Thank you so much. There are four things that makes a service a blessing. The first thing that makes a service a blessing is the weight of God's presence that comes into that service. The presence of God is his greatest token for humanity. When you begin to interact with God in his realm, you will discover that one of the most precious things that spiritual beings crave is the presence of the Lord. And in the very heights of the heavens, Sometimes what makes for the stature of an entity in the spirit is where he's standing in God's presence. When Gabriel appeared to Zacharias, he didn't introduce himself as an archangel. He didn't introduce himself as a being of mysteries. The greatest thing that Gabriel had as a possession in the spirit was where he stood before God. And when he introduced himself, he said to Zacharias, he said, I am Gabriel that standeth in the presence. It costs so much for the presence of God to be given to a generation. And so when you come into a service and the presence of God begins to fitter into that service, maturity in the spirit demands that you suspend everything you are doing and internalize it. Because one of the many things the presence of God will do for you is that it will transform you. What makes you become more like God is not how much you really know about God. There are many theologians that know so much about God, 
but they have no experiential relationship with God. One of the things that makes a man become like God is how much of, of the presence that man carries. And so sometimes when a man enters a place with the presence of God, he doesn't need to talk. The presence of God will begin to, co to command its protocol and things will happen on their own accord. So one, th one reason we gather like this is so that we can absorb more presence. Because when you go into the world, you will need it. The arguments with men, the crisis of life, the challenges you face, one of the things it comes to do is to cause the presence of God to leak out of your life. And that's why sometimes when you are in, engaged in a serious argument or something affects you so deeply, you find yourself dry. Because it comes to deplete you. And so when we gather together like this, one of the precious things God do for us or does for us is that he releases his presence. And the beautiful thing about the presence is that men don't regulate it. And so sometimes it's when the prayers are going on that the weight of the presence comes into the building. If you are discerning, you will align. Sometimes it's when the worship is going on that the presence is heavy in the building. And so while he was ministering, the presence of God was strong. And I was just weeping. And I knew the service is already blessed because God has visited. The second thing that makes a service worthwhile is the move of God's power. The power of God is what addresses the crisis of men. Man is bedeviled with a lot of crisis. And as I begin to share tonight, you will see. If we took a census here tonight, you will, you will discover that 60 to 70% of the people that came here came with issues that troubled them. So when men come to God's presence or come to a fellowship like this, they are trusting that the power of God will locate them and to meet them at the point of their needs. Because the power of God will make a difference as touching your circumstances and the things that surround your life. When the power of God is cast, men will go through crisis and they will be helpless. So when we gather together like this, we come to make contact with power. Sometimes you can be anointed, but you discover that the issues contending you, they are bigger than what you know and carry. So he said, behold, how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. Something happens there. There's an anointing that flows from the head through the beard down to the skirt. That anointing comes to address the crisis of man. And so when we come for fellowship meetings like this, we know that the power of God, we address an issue. So when the power of God is present in a meeting, then you are in a, you are in a blessed environment. The third thing that happens to you in a meeting like this is that you receive precision as touching the truth of God. And so the ministry of the word is very important in a service. The ministry of the word is very important in a gathering. No matter how much you feel in a gathering, if you cannot receive a tangible instruction from God, your life will be without direction. Your life will be without help. Because the word of God is the greatest insurance system that God makes available to men. When you find a generation that is struggling most times, it's because there is a scarcity of God's word in their lives. So people sometimes gather together, they are just excited. But the excitement does not translate to definite direction because the word of God does not come in its tangibility and in its specificity. So even though the man comes to God's presence, he goes back and is still confused because what he requires as a weapon of success in life, he doesn't have it. And so one thing we ensure whenever we gather like this is to make sure the word of God comes forth. So the person leading prayers is bringing the word of the Lord by the Spirit. The person worshipping is bringing the word of the Lord by the Spirit. And when the time comes for the counsel of God to be communicated, the word of God comes with precision. When you come into a service and you receive the word of God with precision, even if you don't feel anything, if you are mature, you know you are blessed. Because that word, you will carry it with you like a weapon. And in the day of crisis, it will come handy. The fourth thing that makes a service a blessing is the love of the Father. When we come into a service like this, we want to experience God's love. Our world is full of bitterness. Our world is full of hate. Our world is full of wickedness and envy. 
And so many times, the only place of refuge you can run to is that place where you, you come into the warm embrace of the Father. And then you know that no matter how dark and treacherous the world is, there is a place of refuge. There is a place where you are accepted as you are. There's a place where you are helped and you are made to stand. There's a place where you don't meet with condemnation. There's a place where you know and touch the essence of God, which is love. And when you carry that love from that service, you discover that everywhere you go to, you begin to give out the fragrance of that love. When people hurt you, you don't give them hurt in return because you don't have hurt in your spirit. What you have in your spirit is the love of the Father. So you are no longer like a man. You have become like an immortal. You function from his realm. Because most of the times, why we are defeated in life is because we are like what we want to fight. And so when the devil comes to you, he will find something. He will find envy. He will find hatred. He will find wickedness. And no matter how capital letter your tongue sounds, you are still vulnerable. Because when he comes, he will find something that is of his. But when you come into a service and you come into the ambience of God's love, you will discover you will be rid of everything that is of the devil. And you come into your world and pour the fragrances of Abba. And you touch the world, a dying world, with the love of God. These things are scarce. You can't find them anywhere. Only in God's presence are they found. Why is it important to share things like this? Because sometimes when we come for a service, we don't even know what to look for. Sometimes when we come for a service, we just want to be excited and go away. We don't even know what to look out for. So many times when the word of God is going on, people are distracted because they didn't come to, they, did, they don't know they came to carry with them words. You came to receive word. You came to receive light. That's what you leave the service with. You didn't come to make friends primarily. You came to take something that will give you an advantage in the world. You came to mingle with God's presence so that you are transformed. You become a better person because when you get to heaven, there will be no register of how many times you went to church. When you get to heaven, there will be no register of how many times you made appearance in the fellowship. But who you become is what the Father is looking out for. And so as we progress in our walk with the Lord, you have to be mindful of these things so that you will know when you are blessed and you will know when you are just excited. So you will know what you carry from a meeting and then you can treasure it. Because if you don't know what to take from a meeting, you may leave a meeting and you will lose it even before you get home. Make sure you leave this service today saturated with the presence that you have carried. Don't let anything diffuse it. Because as you leave this meeting, if you are not careful, the first person you call on the phone will choke and diffuse what you carried. And even though you came for a service, you thought it was a powerful service, you didn't, make it, you didn't benefit from it. Because the presence of God that you were saturated with it didn't even last with you for one day. You make a call and you enter into an argument and it, it diffuses away. You may leave this service and you will not catch a word for yourself. You will just look around and be excited. I've become very careful in exciting people because I discover I talk to young people. So many times when I'm talking, the moment I start touching mysteries, they start shouting, they start jumping, they start running. But if you check their lives, you can't see the result of the mysteries you're interacting with because they don't take words. They just get excited and they're out. No. If we will raise a generation, we must teach them the things that matter. Every week, there should be a word that your spirit has caught. And you have put that word to work and you have seen results. And then you know that I picked this word from here. I used it and this is the outcome. And as you keep doing it like that, you can gauge how your life makes progress. You can tell where you were and you can tell where you are. And you can also tell where you will be. That's why we gather together. And tonight, we thank God for his presence. But the word of God is also coming. And you will receive something. And you will use it. To make your life more beautiful and glorious. In the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's not my message, by the way. Agune chemba Yeshua Hamashia Lion of Judah
Agune Shemba Yeshua Yeshua Hamashia Nayana Judah Agune Shemba You know, last week we began to look into the word of the Lord and we said a generation must rise and the generation the Lord is looking out for is not a generation of prophets it's not a generation of teachers it's not a generation of apostles it's not a generation of evangelists it's not a generation of pastors we said the generation the world is look the Lord is looking for is a generation of kings of priests and of sons when a man attains the stature of a son a king and a priest the lord can send him out with the mandate of the kingdom that man is called an apostle but is actually a son a king and a priest carrying the kingdom when you see a son a king and a priest carrying the burden of the kingdom he is called an apostle when you see a son a priest and a king speaking for god he is called a prophet but primarily it's not an apostle and a prophet that makes the difference in the kingdom it's a son a king and a prophet and the reason is because we saw that the stature of the man jesus in his greatest expression was as a son a king and a prophet and so anybody that attains that height has completed the sequence of growth in the realm of mortals because Jesus is the pattern man Jesus is God's ideal man and God's standard of measuring men is not by their best abilities yesterday you may do something great God is not going to measure you based on how great you did what you did God's standard of measuring men is Christ you may raise the dead yesterday that's beautiful you may do something mighty in the territory yesterday that's glorious but when God wants to measure you he won't measure you by your best he won't measure you by your greatest success when God wants to measure you he will measure you by Christ because Christ is his standard and so when the Bible was teaching us through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians from chapter 4 verse 11 he said the reason God gave apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers is not to heal the saint will the saints be healed yes the saints will be healed because they are still growing to understand what divine health is he said the reason he gave apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers is not to bless them and to prophesy over them he said the reason he gave these offices is to mentor them and to teach them until they come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ and I say when you want to understand the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ how do you trace it in scripture it's only at the time when Jesus himself began to veto himself and he asked the question he said who do men say I the son of man I am just in case you want to weigh me in the balances of God who will you say I am I know many people who have many opinions and true to his thoughts they had many opinions because when the apostles began to speak in Matthew chapter 16 from verse 16 they say some say you are Elias some say you are John the Baptist returned from the dead some say you are Jeremiah and others say you are one of the prophets and Jesus obviously saw that their theological seminary did not have a touch with reality they read the Torah they read the writings of Moses but they didn't have reality you know Jesus said you search the scriptures he said for daring you think you have eternal life he said but I am the life you do not come to me to have life so even though these guys had mastered the Torah when the most important question was asked they didn't know who they were looking for they had read the Torah but they have not met him and so having understood that as bogus as the schools of the law that existed were where but without knowledge he decided to ask the apostles at least you have followed me for a while you should have been delivered from the ignorance of the schools of the law who do you say i the son of man am you know when jesus meets the crowd 
he multiplies fish and feeds a thousand people when Jesus meets the crowd he brings healing but when he comes do you know that Jesus had to stay with 500 men even though multitudes were coming to him because there are many things you can't discuss with the crowd when he meets the crowd he gives healing when he meets the crowd he gives fish but when he came to the disciples you will be shocked that he never organized a healing service with the disciples when you read the whole synoptic gospels there was never a time when Jesus sat down and taught them word of knowledge there was never a time when Jesus sat down with them and taught them most of the things that he did with the crowd when he met them he was interested in something else because when they become the things he gives they too will become givers they will no longer be receivers they will be givers so the burden in the heart of Jesus was to make them givers because Jesus knew that he won't stay on earth for too long and when he leaves the earth the crowd will not profit the kingdom so when he gathers this man he begins to say the things that really matter when you are studying the gospel and you want to find out the things that really matter they are not the things Jesus did with the crowd they are the things he did with the disciples and in this context he was asking them who do you say I am because it's possible for you to walk with me for 10 years and you don't know who I am but he told the story of a great evangelist he traveled to India and this evangelist was the one his interpreter was the one that drove him to the airport and while they were going to the airport he asked the interpreter for how long have you interpreted for this evangelist the man checked check and said 25 years and he now asked the interpreter he didn't he said himself didn't know why he asked the question but he said are you born again and the man said no <laughs> you are shocked are you born again he said no he said why he said well he thought he was just doing his job to help other people so for 25 years he led other people to Christ but he didn't know Jesus he thought it was a show when they come into the stadium and people gather and people are shouting he is interpreting with energy the man will interpret he will interpret the man will speak he will interpret but he didn't know that he's him too is part of those they are talking to he thought they were talking to the crowd and he was transferring the message to the crowd I can assure you that some people can be workers in church and they will never meet Jesus and they will walk in church for many years so Jesus didn't want to take the risk so he asked the disciples I understand if those out there don't know me but who do you say I am and no one knew because even Peter who answered it was at that moment that heaven opened <laughs> They had followed Jesus for close to three years. Nobody knew him. When Peter spoke, Jesus said, you don't know this thing. I know, I know that being around doesn't translate to understanding. He said, I know you too don't know. This thing you just said, it was my heavenly, it's my heavenly father who is in heaven that opened your understanding. So this thing came now. That means if Jesus didn't draw his attention to it on the day of resurrection, they wouldn't have known him. Can you imagine the damage that would have been? He said, even you don't know. It's my father who just told you now. But the question or the answer we are looking for tonight is that Peter said, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. It's from this scripture that we understood the full stature of the man Christ. Not the God Christ. You know, Jesus is both man and God. So we are talking about the man context. Since we are not God in the order of Elohim. We need to understand his dimension as a man and walk in it. And so the man Christ sustained the stature as Christ and son of the living God. Now if you check the word Christ, it's the word Christos. The word Christos was translated from the Hebrew word Mashiach. And the word Mashiach was used 39 times in the Old Testament. And in those 39 times, 37 times it was translated as the anointed one. It was only twice it was translated as messenger and so when you trace the Christ you are talking about a being called the anointed one so if you want to understand the anointing you have to go back to the Old Testament to find out who are the anointed people in the Old Testament you will discover that the word Mashiach was used only when a king is anointed the word Mashiach is used only when a priest is anointed and the word Mashiach is used when a prophet is anointed. So when Jesus is called the Christos, 
if you trace it in its word, in its literal meaning, it's talking about the king, it's talking about the priest, and it's talking about the prophet. So when Peter said, you are the Christ, <coughs> what Peter was saying is that you are the king, you are the priest, you are the son of the living God. And so everybody who comes to the fullness of the stature of Christ will not just be a healer. He will not just be a prophet. He will not just be an apostle. He must also function in the order of the king. He must function in the order of the priest. And he must function in the order of the son of the living God. That's why when he resurrected from the grave, he didn't call them apostles. He said, go and tell the disciples that my father and your father that means they had come into sonship in sonship there's many things they can do go and tell them that I'm going to my father and to their father because what bothers the heart of Jesus is when he returns to the world he wants to find kings he wants to find priests and he wants to find prophets you see man may not understand this that what the devil is interested in is to ensure that you don't get into the fullness of your reality when he showed up in the garden of eden he was not bothered about taking away the things that the man had when the devil showed up in the garden of eden he wanted to truncate the growth process of the man because he knows that if he truncates the growth process the man will always beg for the things that he should command so when the devil comes he's not just looking at the things you have he wants to stop you perpetually from becoming the order of the stature of Christ and if he can stop you from becoming that all your life you'll be running in pursuit of the things you should command and so you may run to a healing service and when you receive healing you say thank you Jesus Jesus will receive the thanks but Jesus is Jesus is hard to be grieved because Jesus is not just interested in giving you healing he's wanting why can't you walk in divine health there is something better than healing. When you come for a service and we prophesy and a breakthrough happen and you come and say, thank you, Jesus, he will receive the thanks. But what he's looking for is, why can't you command all things? Don't you know that all things are yours? You can't know those things because your growth process has not been completed. My brother, Apostle Lawa, works in the miraculous. And many times when we come for a healing meeting, you know that the anointing you came with, for example, I can pray for the sick now and he'll be healed. But you know that what the people need is not just the healing. So many times you will labor to open scriptures, open scriptures. You want to build their faith because you know that they need to walk in this thing. If not, they will keep coming back. That's the burden in the heart of Jesus. And the reason is because if man does not grow, the realm where he's living in is too hostile. The things he receives, he will lose them and come back again. And over time, that man will become a slave of things. Whenever he shows up, he will be showing up because he needs something. But God does not want the man to show up because he needs something. That's why before God allowed the man liberty, he gave him everything he needed. So when the man shows up, he's coming for deeper communication because there are things and dimensions in God that he wants the man to explore. You know, when you make a new friend, every day you know him better. You know him better. He may give you things, but the idea behind the relationship is for you to explore the dimensions. So what God is looking for in fellowship is to bring us to a point where when we show up, we are not coming to ask God for things. We are looking for secret dimensions in God that is not available so that we will catch it and we will reveal it to our generation. But unfortunately, because men have not grown up, when they come to God, they are distracted by things. They keep asking for things and God is saying, grow up, grow up. Because if you keep receiving things, you will keep needing things. But when you grow to become a, a worker of those things, you will not need those things anymore. And if you think it's a lie, Jesus showed up again in John chapter 10 verse 10. And he began to tell man some secrets. He said, before you came here, there were spirits here. You are not the first creature on earth. There were many spirits here that came before you. That's why I need you to grow into dominion. Because if I give you what I'm giving you, the spirits that are in this realm are older than you. They will take it away from you again. Everything you think you can have when you have it, sometimes those spirits will not even take it from you. They will make you a slave of those things. 
and those things will become the reason why you may never grow again so he said in John chapter 10 verse 10 he said the devil cometh not but for to kill to steal and to destroy the devil cometh not what Jesus was revealing to them is not even about the activity of the devil primarily what Jesus was revealing to them is that where you are you are not alone there are other beings where you are there are other beings that have come to where you are and they are contending with you for ownership of that realm so you need to first of all understand that you are not alone there are other spirits here that want to take over what rightly belongs to you you are not alone here there are spirits here and they said those spirits are in different order they say one of them are the devils and what the devils do is that they kill the first thing they want to do is to take away your right in the realm of God the life that you have the authority that you have that's what he's looking for when he takes it he will now destroy and he will now steal from you he said but not to worry the devil is not the only person around he said I too am come because I saw that the devil came you know the devil came first he said because I saw that the devil came me too I had to come that means man's greatest achievement in life is the degree to which he fraternizes with the spirit that controls the realm because if he does not know how to fraternize with those spirits, he will become a puppet and a slave in the realm where he's living. Because there are some spirits that came and there's another spirit that has come. The spirits that came are the wicked spirits of this world. But the other spirit that have come is the spirit of Elohim that came to give the man liberty. If this man does not understand that he's in a league of spirits, he will be pursuing things and he will know that those things are the things that the spirit will use to bargain his soul. So what the man should be looking for are not things. What the man should be looking for is intimacy with those spirits. To find the right spirit and to fraternize with him. Because it is the depth of his fraternity with that spirit that will determine the advantage that he has in time. Not the things he has. Even the greatest thing you have can become a weapon against you. If a spirit that is wiser than you takes control. That's why people use money today to self-destruct. That's why people use cars today to self-destruct. I was watching the news two years ago of a popular musician. The word they use is blow. So he released the song and he, he blew. <laughs> when he blew, what the spirit whispered into his ear is to buy a Lamborghini. And when he bought the Lamborghini, the same spirit that was luring him, lured him into a party. And he went to a club and he drank until 2 a.m. Those of you who are current in that world, you know who I'm talking about. At 2 a.m., he now carried two gears in his car. And the way they were playing the music, the car was shaking like this. And the guy was running on high speed. So what happened is that that thing he was doing was a spiritual algorithm. The spirit was directing his step to destruction. So what happened to the guy was that at about 2.30 a.m., he ran into a ditch. And him and the ladies died. So what the spirit did was that he used the inspiration of a song to produce an album. He used the album to blow the guy. And when he blew the guy, he really blew him. <laughs> so when you don't know the spirits that control the league, what you call a, call a blessing can become a curse. So what Jesus was teaching them is before you consider things, he said, make fraternities first. The devil came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. You know those things Jesus was saying? If, unless you enter the spirit realm, you will not understand. That he actually gave man a leakage because that's a manifesto. You know, when a politician is, is vying for an office, he gives a manifesto. He will stand like our politicians. Everything they are saying, you know, is a lie. I will, I will bring quality education. Anyone they say, just know it's the opposite. I will make sure light and power is stable. I will bring water. I will ensure security. They are all lies. So, <laughs> when Jesus showed up, he said, my name is ancient of days. I was around when the devil made his manifesto. You were not there. Because you are 70 years old. You are a baby. The realm where we sit, we saw the devil. And when the devil made his manifesto in the spirit, he said, my own assignment is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So if you are wise, don't fraternize with him. If you are wise, come into a deeper fraternity. Because before the devil made the manifesto, there is somebody called 
I am. The word I am means I was. I currently am. And I will be. So I know the devil and his plans. And I know where all his plans will end. So when he said I am come. It's not English he's speaking. What he's actually telling you is that. The beginning and the end is here. The devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal and to destroy. But I am has come. So when you know, what you need to do is to find I am. Is to interact with I am. Because when you interact with I am, you will become a lord over the devil. But if you don't interact with the I am, you will become a slave of the devil. So what God was telling man there, is not that I will bring you provision. He was giving the man a choice. A choice of either becoming a captain over the devil or of becoming a slave of the devil. I am is come to give you an opportunity. Because in I am, you can journey to a place that is older than the devil. Because I am existed before the devil came. I am is existence. So when you come into I am, everything the devil knows, you will know more. Because you will become older than him. You will be in him. And if you, become, if you come into I am, where the devil is going to, you will know it. So on the strength of your interaction with I am, you will become older than the oldest. That's why you may look young and they look at you, they say, how old you are you? You are judging by age in time. I am relating with I am. If I'm relating with I am, I've stepped out of time. I've gone to the foundation of reality. That's where we live from. That's what Jesus called life to the full. Life to the full is not to have many things. Because if it's about many things, the Bible will be contradicting itself. He say a man's life does not constitute in the multitude of his possession. So what Jesus was talking about is to come into a place where you become a controller over the affairs of life so that the devil's intuit will count for nothing. If he likes, he should sum us out. When he finished doing it, you know where he's going to and you become wiser than the devil. That's the journey of I am. So for you to be able to become a king, a priest and a prophet, you must interact with the different dimensions of I am. Becoming a king and a prophet is not a willful desire. It's a journey of intimacy. Because when he spoke about life, he wasn't talking about breath. He was talking about interaction. In John 17 verse 3, he said, This is life eternal, that you may know him. So the depth of I am that you know is what will determine your level of authority in the natural realm. And Jesus did not make it difficult. He began to break, you know, there are seven dimensions that the Bible revealed to us that grants us access into the knowledge of God. The first dimension is actually the I am dimension. In the I am dimension, the Bible gave us seven tributaries. And I want to talk about one this evening, briefly, before we move. If you study the scriptures, especially in the book of John, there were seven times Jesus used I am. The first time he said I am, he said I am the resurrection and the life. That's why when he said I am come, he said you will have life to the full because I am is resurrection and life. The second time he used I am, he said I am the bread of life. The third time he used I am, he said I am the door. The fourth time he used I am, he said I am. Who follows me? Who is following me? Who is following me? I am the way, the truth, and the life. The fifth time he used I am. What did he say? He said, I am the good shepherd. The sixth time he used I am, he said, I am divine. I am divine. What Jesus was trying to reveal to us is that you don't just know me on the street. For you to know me, there are channels you need to enter. It's either you come in through life and resurrection, or you come in through the door, or you come in through the way. And the seventh time he said, I am the light of the world. Or you come in through the light. If you don't find Christ through any of this access way, you will be a slave of the devil. And so the journey of man on the earth is to find different channels into I am. Kingdom pursuit is not things. It's how many dimensions of I am you have found. For some of you, you will find light. And when you find light, everything the devil is doing is open to you. You can read his move like a book. And that light will become direction. That light will become strength. When those things begin to happen to you, it means you are beginning to grow into the stature of Christ. Because Jesus himself revealed to us how we can find him. He said, one of the ways you can find me is to find light. 
He said, the second way you can find me is to eat the bread. If you find the bread that came from heaven, you will find me. He said, the third way you can find me is to drink of the vine. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He said, the fourth way you can find me is to be granted access. That's what we call revelations and encounter. A door opens to you and you come in. You didn't read it, but you know it. He said, the fifth way you can find me is to come in. Because I'm a teacher. I will open your heart and I will teach you my oracles. When you begin to enter these doors, it means you are growing. So one thing we do when we gather together like this is to explore the many dimensions of I am. And when you begin to explore it, you will discover that something begins to happen to you. The things that happen to you are no longer earthly. You can just lie down in your room and because you have met I am, it begins to educate you from within. You will now realize that the Christian life is heavier inside than it's outside. When your Christianity is heavier outside, you have not met him. Because when you meet him, your heart will become a school. Many activities will be going on at the same time. And you are one, people will wonder what is going on here. You are in another world. Because you must be taught in that world before you can colonize this world. But if you learn from this world, you will be part of the problem. Acting as if you are a solution. You can't bring solution until you enter into it. If you don't go through that door, if that light does not appear to you, if you don't eat of that bread, if you don't make contact with the resurrection, there is no way you can make change in your life. So when Christians are no longer pursuing I am come, when Christians are not joining into I am come, they are not making progress. Everything they have can become the reason for their misfortune. And so I am was one of the channels Jesus revealed to the world of finding him. Let's consider I am life this evening quickly because we don't have so much time I am the resurrection and the life is one of the dimensions of knowing Jesus you see when you come to Christ one thing he wants to do one encounter he will give you is that he will give you life but the thing with the encounter of life is that you don't feel it because life is a journey when I am wants to bring you to his realm and to his stature, one of the encounters he gives you is life. When he gives you the encounter of life, what will happen is that you will grow in it. And as you grow in it, you will discover a point will come when, when men look at you, they will know that you are functioning from another realm. They will know that you are functioning by another, inst another resource. They will know that you are communicating from another dimension. So the journey of Christianity is encounters with I am and one of the encounters is the encounter of life when a man has the encounter of life the first thing that happens to him is what we call a knowing a knowing I'm showing you a dimension of Christianity that is not on the buffet I'm showing you a dimension of Christianity that requires solitude I'm showing you a dimension of Christianity that requires responsibility I'm showing you why there is so much activity but there are many babes because we don't know the organics we know the common we know the trending we know the popular if i call for a healing service now i can begin to walk healing from the beginning but you'll be shocked that many people will go back they will fall sick again and they will never grow all the people jesus healed were sinners all the people he rose from the dead they died again but there were other people that by the bible never recorded that jesus healed there were other people the Bible never recorded that Jesus prophesied over. But suddenly those ones, when Jesus left, they showed up. And when men looked at them, they said, ah, they took note that these ones have been with Christ. He never healed them, but there is another thing he taught them. That's why he took them to the mountain. It was a school of life. I know that when I come down to the valley, I say, be healed. Everybody in the city will be healed. But encounters of life is not by a declaration. It's a journey. Encounters of life is not by a commandment. The Bible said when the evening was come, in Matthew chapter 8 verse 16, they brought all that were sick to him. And he said that they may touch him. And he said virtue went out of him and healed them all. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. The land of, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. He said they that were in darkness have seen great light. He healed them all. But when he wanted to bring the encounters of life, he took them to the mountain for three days. Because in the encounters of life, it's a syllable. Is a protocol. It will keep unveiling. Many times, our Christianity becomes too distracting. 
that we no longer pay attention to the encounters of life because when it comes into your spirit it will become a law over your soul it will draw your attention it will require your focus and your commitment but too many times we don't develop it so we are big on the outside but when you check us inside we are so small we cannot sense when a signal is activated meanwhile that signal that is activated may be a summon to high quarters because life is speaking you know there is not only the holy ghost that is on your inside talking even life itself has a voice life has an utterance that's why when a child is born they, you, do, you don't hear any transmission the child knows hunger hunger will communicate to the child and the child begins to look for what to eat and you are wondering how did you know that food passes through the mouth there's an educational syllable the mom doesn't teach the child that you eat from the mouth hope you know that when the child was in the pregnancy in the womb the child was eaten by umbilical cord the child never ate with the mouth but the day the child came out all of a sudden he begins to look for things to put in the mouth who taught the child that you eat from the mouth because life itself is an educational syllable life itself it will train you it will teach you but when your christianity is full of distraction you will not learn the whispers of life so when life is talking you will be running and doing things that's why after many years you will not grow because if that child does not learn how to eat that child will die after one week when you encounter the life the life becomes a teaching the life becomes a training the life becomes a way it will educate you and the teachings of life are silent because it doesn't want any other person to hear it is specific to you as you are sitting here now if you are pressed nobody will know life will speak to you in the most silent fashion because it's an organic communication but if you don't go out to ease yourself you will become most uncomfortable and the next person sitting by your side will be wondering why are you so uncomfortable i'm hearing something very loud but you can't hear it even if you are my best friend it will be so loud that you can't sit down anymore but the next person can't hear it because they are inaudible utterances they are intangible communication but the impact can kill the impact can awaken that's how god raises men through life he brings them into a syllable when a man makes encounter with life the first thing that happens is a knowing it's a knowing you need to understand all your spiritual faculties and you need to understand how they speak to you when hunger comes it's different from when you are pressed the responses are different when you function like that you are not a man of activity you are an organic man and that's how spiritual life also is you need to know when there is danger you pick it here and as you pick it you leave people don't know why it's not word of knowledge it's not the holy ghost that spoke to you it's an inaudible utterance that proceeds from life but if you don't get there you can't be like the christ you can never be like the christ that life will speak to you sometimes when you say the wrong thing you lose your peace and then somebody else is saying what happened you say i can't sleep why i spoke against this brother and then the, uh, uh, i beg forget is it is the weight of life that you carry another person can speak against a brother and he's smiling it's a normal thing he feels okay but you that you join that conversation you will now lose your peace and then you go to god and you are apologizing and the people are wondering what did you do you say i'm sorry i spoke against my brother you are in two different realms one is functioning by life the other one is a religious man he doesn't know where you are it's an economy that works in the christ the way jesus lived his life is by functioning by the motions of life it was so strong in him that sometimes when jesus is even traveling life will restrain him you will hear that jesus must go through samaria the holy ghost didn't talk but life is governing the direction that he will go if you want to grow in this kingdom you must begin to function by the sensitivities of life there are many things that life is telling you that you didn't hear imagine if you were a child and you were born you didn't eat for one week you didn't eat for one month imagine if you at your level of maturity now you don't ease yourself for one week it will be something that will require intensive care be why that's how most of us are in the spirit activities cannot replace life the operations of life they are embedded in you when life comes there's a protocol the first protocol is in knowing that's why jesus said this is life eternal that you may know that you may know that you may know and many times when people don't know god now sends messengers to tell them because if they are not taught and brought into that awareness they can't grow i'm assuring you you can give all your money you can give all your possession you will think you are pleasing god by giving 
and because you are happy about it you will give until you will give your all but you will not grow and then you are wondering because even the feedback system of the spirit you have not been told to pay attention to it so when you went to give you left and God now spoke your answer came but you don't know how it works and then you are waiting for external things our spirituality is not all external the deeper part of our Christianity is internal but unfortunately many believers have negated the internal dimension that's why even though they are walking they are not alive in 1st John chapter 5 verse 11 he said when you receive Jesus it was not a religious activity when you receive Jesus he said you had an encounter with life so he began to tell them he said these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you may know life will insist that you know that you have eternal life is written to you since you cannot pick the frequency God sends men to remind you that the heaviest part of you is not external I know you can talk loud I know you can pray but there is something at work on your inside that you are not paying attention to many times God speaks to you from inside much more than he speaks from outside how come you are used to the external but you can't pick the internal he said you can grow so these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. So when a man receives Jesus, he's not coming to learn how life works. It's already there. All you need to do is to draw his attention to it. This is where his victory begins from. When a man knows that there's something at work on his inside, next time he wakes up and he hears a song, he will drop his phone and start singing that song. Because he knows that song is not coming because he heard somebody sing it. He knows that song is life giving amplification to an organic thing happening on the inside. That is not church activity. That is operation of the spirit within you. Life is at work. Sometimes you wake up and you want to eat. And then it looks as if eating is a sin. You are very hungry. But you know that life is placing a demand. And the moment you know now that there is life, you will keep the food aside and you begin to walk around. You want to find out what is life saying that I don't know. What is he saying? Because sometimes the whisper is very faint. So you need, to, you need to pay attention. And so sometimes you quickly step out of the room. And then you go somewhere early in the morning. And then people are wondering, is he mad? You know, these things can become so strong. That sometimes while you are walking alone, you are walking like this. And somebody is looking at you and say, Jesus, what's happening to him? You, you are trying to connect to a frequency. There's an alignment pattern. There's an alignment pattern. The whispers are too faint. Anything can, can break that frequency. And because you don't want it to go, you, you are following it carefully. And after a while, it will become louder. It will become louder. You will now hear that, take a fast for three days. That three days is your safety. Sometimes the bottle of oil they poured on your head can't save you. Because your safety is in a discernment that must be activated. And life have checked that you are rusty. So he said, take a three days fast because on the third day, which is the evil day, I need you to pick the frequency. And when you take that fast, maybe you woke up on the third day and you stepped out of your house. You want to open your car. He said, no, not car today. Your car will be parked. You will take an Uber. People can't understand. That's when you become like the wind that blow it. He said, thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth. He said, so are they that are born by the Spirit. It's an organic protocol. When Jesus said, Whoever is born of God overcometh the world. He wasn't telling us a parable. He was telling us things that happen to men when they grow. When men grow, they become invincible. Because that life is so personal. Even if the devil put his ear on your chest, he can't pick those vibrations. Because it's networking to you. And so the devil will be around, but his presence will not matter. That's why he said, even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. There's something happening in us. He said, the life is the light of man. And he said, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness can't comprehend it. He can't understand because it's an intangible language. You are wondering, how did they know that we were waiting here? Life spoke. And the man mastered it. He paid attention to it many times. Sometimes when life discovers that your ear in the spirit is rusty, it will tell you to go on a 40 days fast. It's not religion. Forget you can fast with your church in January. That's beautiful. It's corporate exercise. But if you want to grow, you need more than 21 days January fast. You need, sometimes it will take 90 days. Because God wants to promote you. But the place is promoting you. They are hyenas there. Hyenas that want to eat you up. 
So life will have to prepare you first. And then it tells you, for 90 days, take a fast. Sometimes you want to sleep and life will wake you up. You can't sleep now. You can't sleep. That's why my friend was preaching. He said, the times when kings go to war, these are intangible alarms. It's so loud, but your neighbor can't hear it. If those knowings don't happen, your Christianity is fake. Not because you want to be fake, but everything you do, it will look spiritual, but it will have no root in the realm where it matters. When you want to see a true believer, he functions by the motions of life. Whatever he orders must come to pass. Because those things, they came from the realms of the I am. When the courts alter their oracles, it beams into you through the light. That's why he puts it in you. So that you can hear things that me, ordinary men can hear. It's a product of intimacy. It's a product of fraternity. Too many Christians are dead on the inside. They can't pick the signals. We are many, but we are weak. Because we don't know life. It begins with a knowing. Some of you, as you hear these words, you will discover that that engine on your inside that was rusty is beginning to shake. And when you leave this service, life will now tell you this night, pray it in money. Something has started. And then in the night, you are walking in your room, you are praying. You are praying. And then you think the prayer ends in the morning. It doesn't end in the morning. When the morning comes, he will now tell you this week, read the book of John. And then you are wondering, why do I need to read the book of John? He's looking for how to energize your spirit. You have been rusty. You didn't exercise for long. Those days when we were younger, we would go to the field sometimes once in a month. And then you that ran to run around the field ten times. You now run for five minutes. You are breathing. <laughs> As if you want to die. It's been long. The veins have become stiff. The flexibility is no longer there. So when life wants to drill you, the encounters take a while. He will drill you until you come, you become flexible. And so when you become flexible, even if a whisper pass, you can pick it. And then you say, ah, I just saw an angel. And somebody look at you and say, ah, ah, is that how easy it is to see angels? You are walking in different dimension. But when we become mature, that day will come. When everybody will know the frequency. If you pick a wrong song, everybody will know that you are in the flesh. You'll be jumping. Hey, hey, everybody look, look, look. People look at you like this. You are in the flesh. Just step aside, step aside. Because, you know, that life hates death. So when you do things of the flesh, it will be irritated. You are singing a gospel song. People are irritated. And you are saying, is it not Jesus I'm glorifying? You are, it's your flesh you are glorifying. You want to dance because you think it's a show. So you come, you do like this, you do like this. This is not a show. Life will resist you. And when you are functioning in the flesh, everybody will look at you and say, get out. And suddenly you move, somebody else comes. And that person is singing a song. They don't know the song, but life is communicating with life. That's Christianity. Until we come there, we are not strong. We can't fight the battles of the age. And so the encounter every believer must have is the encounter of life. This one is not taught in the Bible school. It's a journey with the Holy Ghost. He will strengthen it from the inside. When knowing comes, then maturity has begun. The journey of life. This is why Christianity in Africa is weak. You know, when Pastor Victor was praying, some people started praying. They thought it was five minutes. When the prayer reached 15 minutes, they discovered life is not enough. When the prayer reached 30 minutes, some people advised themselves and sat down and began to do like this. But if you know how life works, that point where you are weak, that's when you are beginning to touch the engine. It's no longer about how long they want to pray. Something is dying here. I want to resurrect it. So even though you don't feel like it, you now discover we walk by faith, not by sight. You are staring something. And if you activate that thing, you will sense ventilation. Encounter with I am is an encounter with life. Some of you have life, but that life is dead. Because you don't know how long. You don't know when you touched it. You don't know. You have activated your emotion. Your emotion is too strong. When they sing a song, you know you are jumping like this. When they change the song, you become like this. Because it's emotion you are walking with. Life is not being touched. But when the Holy Ghost wants to help you, 
it will bring you back to the corridor of life. And for some of you, for life to be stirred, it will take many days of fasting. That kind of fasting now, you don't count days. You count moments. The time when life was touched. A point come when the Holy Ghost brings you diagnosis of prayer. And then he tells you, pray for four hours every day. The first two weeks you will sleep throughout. But you can't stop. Because it's not about one week. It's not about two weeks. There is something dying that he wants to resurrect. When you don't stop, maybe after one month, you now go to prayer and you, you just sense an energy from inside. You now know, oh, that's when the prayer began. The other ones were exercised. Life is about to cook him. And when it's cooking, kikakaku, you will now begin to pray into realms. You will now discover prayer is not just loud tongues. Prayer is about bettings. Is there as soon as Zion travel, she brought forth her children. You will now discover prayer is about journeying. Journeying. You can be in your room and you will travel to North Africa. And then when you come back, you will tell the nations what God is saying. It's from the economy of life. Too many Christians are not alive. Too many. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You are dead on the inside. Benihim told the story of a rabbi in Israel. This lady was demonized. They took her everywhere. Everybody prayed for her. Prophets, apostles prayed for her. Nothing happened. But where they lived in Israel, because they are a wealthy family, at the foot of the rock, there was a rabbi that is always indoors. Every time you are passing, as they are passing to go up, the man is citing the Torah. He's reading the Torah. And he's prophesying. And he's speaking in tongues. They say this man is a noise speaker. What kind of man is this? When they tried everybody. And Christians were not producing results. They now went to imams. Imams too could not produce results. They now said. Let's try this man who is always disturbing us at the foot of the rock. And they went and told the man. Our daughter is demonized. We don't know. We've done everything. The man now said, go, I'm coming. And two hours later, the man came out of his house and he began to climb the mountain. And he was just talking. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. As the man was ascending the rock, the demons began to leave the gear in the house. The moment the man came to the door, and opened the door the lady was delivered there was no need for prayer he came with energy he came with a realm he came with a dimension why do you think we preach and our world is not changing we are talking things that we read we are mental but the weight of life is light that's why one man can be addressing five thousand people but the city can't feel it because it's from head to head the day it becomes spirit to spirit you will find men that will turn their worlds upside down because you don't necessarily need a long sermon you need weights of glory but for that to happen 
yourself must be cooked and incubated in the chambers of life. There is a knowledge that is scarce among mortals. And so Jesus came to bring us that knowledge. So the idea is not breath. It's so that you can travel back to the conclave where possibilities that are not cut up, where mortals dwell, rest. And when you come with those possibilities, even if you say Jesus is Lord, your territory will feel the vibration. That's what we call the stature of the Christos. He carried too much life. When Jesus came down from the mountain, the moment he entered the synagogue, demons began to cry, leave us alone. Leave us alone. Why have you come before your time? Because of life. Because of life. But we don't have it. We have the theological one. The organic one is weak. Because the organic one will disciple you. The organic one will take you through a process. Many times, that life will stop you from sleeping. If you know that growth is not just about church service, you will pay attention. Because it may take 30 days of, of being awake at night for that life to be energized. You may come to church for five years, but they may not touch those cords. Some of you will come here and will not be able to touch your cord. But when you live here, the Holy Ghost will now give you an instruction. And as you follow, you will discover you will receive things in your bedroom that you could not receive on the crusade ground. It's a knowing. It begins with a knowing. Please sit down. This knowing has three layers. The first layer is consciousness. This is where you move from theology to organic experience. See, when this consciousness comes, you will just know that if I touch that cancer, that cancer will go. You are not coming reciting scripture. There is a place where you are coming and you are quoting scriptures because you are hoping one will work. There is another place where the scriptures have become a part of you because you have walked and interacted with this thing until it has become your consciousness. So when you come, you know if only I touch, things will happen. When you have entered that level, you know you have begun to grow in life. It's a consciousness. That's the consciousness the psalmist had. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Many people are coming to church, but they have their own consciousness. Do you know that there are many believers here who, who, know they, who believe they can be cursed? I know you have not told yourself, but any time you say you want to curse another believer, it's because you have a consciousness that a believer can be cursed. And because you have that consciousness, even you can be cursed. Do you know there are many believers that think evil will happen to them? A wrong consciousness. They have not interacted with life enough. That's why before he announced life, he talked about death. He talked about destruction. Because when life comes, he rules over death. He rules over destruction. He rules over things taken away. When you, when you think evil of another believer, it's because you think it's possible for evil to happen to a believer. But if you have entered a consciousness where you know that evil can happen to a believer, you can't think evil of another believer. When you enter a consciousness level where you know that a believer cannot be caused, you can't cause another believer. The reason why we do a lot of religion but we don't have manifestation is because our consciousness is wrong. And our consciousness is wrong because we have not fine-tuned to the Christ. When you fine-tune to the Christ, a point comes, you will know that anything that can happen to Jesus can happen to you. This is not theology. This is not religion. It's a reality. That's what life comes to do to you. That's why Paul said, if you say that you are born again, if you believe that your life is hid in Christ and in God, he said, let your consciousness, let your affection be only on the things above. Most times we are saying one thing, our consciousness is saying another thing. The reason is because we've not interacted with life enough. That's why John said, I'm writing to you that you will know. Paul was saying the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He said, whoever is in Christ Jesus, he said he's a new creature. He said, all things are passed away. He now said, behold. The key word is behold. It means become aware that every other thing is of God. So anything that is not of God can't happen to you. When you come to that level, you are beginning to journey into dominion. Nothing man does that moves you. 
There's too much assurance in your spirit because life has been trained. There are too many believers waiting to hear something positive before they are excited. When they hear something positive, they are jumping up and down. When they hear something negative, I travel a lot. Sometimes I want to travel for a great meeting. I will now see myself in a coffin. I'm in a coffin. They are going to bury me. And then the me in the dream is afraid. When I wake up, I say, well, since I saw it, I'm not the one. I don't pray about it. They know. I don't pray about it. If I'm not to go for that journey, we know. I don't need to see a lying vision. I know. You can't manipulate me. I've been in places, people come, say all kinds of things. Hey, they saw you, you died. We don't die. You don't know what I had in the last eight months. But there's too much life. I can't even be worried. Sometimes when they say things and they tell me I laugh, I say it's because we are making impact. Five years ago, when I was not making impact, nobody spoke about me. If people have the time to speak about me, it means I'm making impact. Glory to God. But the thoughts of man can come to pass. The desires of the evil cannot come to pass because there's something in your, in your life. You are rooted in life. Too rooted for anything to happen to you. It begins with consciousness. When we tell people to meditate on scripture, it's not to know scriptures and quote. It's so that they can grow in the spirit. You become one with it. That's the idea. When we tell men to pray, they go. It's not to say I cancel 10 hours. That's for babes. When you have grown, you know that as soon as Zion travel, she brought forth. It's the bettings of prayer you are looking for. You can pray into a place. You can pray into a dimension. You journey by prayer. And when you get there, even 10 hours is too small. Because sometimes you travel too far. You can't come back that day. And then you are just on the floor in your room sobbing. You went too far. You go to certain places in prayer and then you begin to interact with celestial things your body literally begins to burn you can feel the heat so much it's as if your hand is on the stove and while you are unconscious praying you are crying because you have gone too far you are you are no longer in control your hand is burning you are you are you are hoping and begging that they will withdraw the intensity a bit because you are you are becoming something else is the journey of life it takes consciousness to travel but too many believers don't have these experiences because they don't know what to focus on it's not about activity most times workers in church become the most carnal. they never hear the word of god they think it's just about doing things if you don't grow what you are doing will be a waste because the point will come you will do it for flesh These things I'm telling you, nothing can replace it. You may know a lot of principles, but you may still be a babe in the realm where it matters. Because everything you are doing is from your head. You can't move here. But God is looking for the man that flows from the river of life. I told Pastor Victor, I said from Monday, it's not announced, but we'll be praying here for three hours straight. No prayer point. When you stand, pray for one hour straight. Let something, let something affect you a little until something is quickened. We are too strong in the flesh. Hey. When you grow in consciousness, then life will take you to another level. It's called engagement. All of that is still under knowing. Engagement. It is in engagement that you begin to test your muscles. Sometimes you are walking. And then you are at the airport. And then you see somebody on the wheelchair. And then life will now move you. Say pray for her. <laughs> you will look around. Pray for who? Here. Christianity is not on the pulpit. It's not on the pulpit. Forget this craze about wearing suit and preaching on the pulpit. 
if you have not traveled in the corridor of life and you come here you will bring reproach to the name of the Lord sometimes you come to work and life will move you say talk to your boss even you you will know you want to faint but it is in that engagement that you are strengthened and I assure you when you begin engagement you will fail many times that failure is to build conviction not because what you are doing is not working but if it works the first time you did it you will think you are a champion you will lose the lesson so many times when you try it you will fail you will try it you will fail but life won't let you rest the last time you went to speak to a lady she embarrassed you publicly life will still drag you to talk to more the last time you prayed for the sick you carried her up she fell down they almost beat you life will still move you you will do it until a point come the idea will no longer be manifestation it will become who you are so manifestations no longer move you when it becomes who you are manifestation becomes the byproduct life will take you from consciousness to engagement i'm showing you see christianity in our generation now is to gather in auditoriums those of you who have been believers for the past 15 years you know that in those days when you gave your heart to christ it was about soul winning it was about going out and praying for the sick you went house to house but i assure you now we are looking for the conferences where the big preachers are coming that's why we are applauding men but we are not growing because we don't give life enough ventilation if you give life ventilation it will first of all set you up before it delivers you how far have you traveled with life when they say i am come he was bringing you into a realm Sometimes life will move you to talk to your father. This thing you are doing is wrong. And Jesus said, I should tell you. Your father will look at you like this. <laughs> you will go back and cry. Lord, why? And God will keep quiet. You are in a school. This one is harder than church service. It's deeper than a message. It's an organic process. The man that everybody dreads. Life will tell you, go and confront him. And tell him if he doesn't repent, he will die. Sometimes you will need three days fasting and prayer to be able to generate enough life to take that step. But that's how you grow. You journey from consciousness to engagement. When you engage for a while, then you enter mastery. It's when you enter mastery that you have liberty of flexibility. You know, the first time I saw Ben Him remove his suit and threw at people, they fell down. I went for a crusade. When I heard that the people were praying loud, I now say, There's energy in this hall now. I removed my suit. When I hit it on the person, he held it like this and gave me back. You don't do what Benihim is doing. You travel until you get there. When you get there, life will give you your own flair. Because mastery comes with dimensions. Dimensions. You may not need to. There's a man called Andres Bisoni. He's of the offspring of Benihim and people like Carlos and Carlos and Akondia. He drank from them. He drew from them. Until now, when he comes for a meeting. When he's done preaching, everybody stand up, they gather. If he does like this, the whole people will fall down. He didn't need to do what Benihim was doing. As he journeyed in life, he entered mastery. And when he entered mastery, his own flair came out. So that the glory of God, you can see different dimensions of it. If all of us begin to copy Benihim, we will limit Jesus Christ. But the only way we can give Jesus access is when we journey in life. You will leave this meeting today and some of you will go back and begin to pay attention to the impulses of life. That's the deepest aspect of your Christianity. The deepest aspect of your Christianity is not what you are doing in church. It's not even what you felt. What you felt may leave after the meeting. But when you begin to master those impulses of the spirit, sometimes you will grow in it until it will break as a song. My friend Dunsin was a bass guitarist. But he grew in life until a point came a voice broke out and when he sings you will know this is not a psalmist this is a priest because what is coming out is the river that flow from the throne 
when he's ministering you can literally see the sea of glass because he's typing the dimensions of heaven it will be a waste for you to look at somebody and want to copy there's no room for copying in this world this realm where we are there's more than enough we are interacting with El Shaddai but if you have not journeyed in life you will take the option of copying people and when you copy even if you are best you'll be second best and God will not need you because he already has one of that order there is something that God has planted in you that it will take life to get there when you begin to travel on this path Christianity has begun for you the first ordinance of life is in knowledge that knowledge is consciousness that knowledge leads to engagement and that knowledge leads to mastery the second ordinance of life is yieldedness this life does not just come to make you manifest it's a government ah wait time is gone time is gone oh Jesus I wanted to and this is where I wanted to ascend time is gone you know when you are dealing with life the first thing it does is that it woos you it will show you things you will now come to a place it will tell you this cripple will walk and then your pursuit will be let cripples walk let cripples you are praying you are fasting for one year cripples will walk word of knowledge that's the elementary when life begins to grow in you you will discover that he lured you you will come to a point where it will now place a law over you that's why in Romans chapter 8 verse 2 he called it the law of the spirit of life when it comes it will put a law over you that law is what we call consecration consecration is not rules and regulation rules and regulation are necessary when you are beginning to guide yourself until you tap into life when you come into life you will now begin to touch the true tenets of consecration the true tenets of consecration is inside it flows from inside out discipline is from outside in consecration is from inside out that's why he said because thou lovest righteousness and hated iniquity it wasn't something he was trying to do he had built something on the inside that hates him that's what causes him to align with god so when life begins to grow in you that life will teach you the way of consecration it will bind you it will keep you under severe government and the way he does it is twofold number one is through hunger when truly life begins to grow in you you will discover that there is an uncontrollable and irresistible pull towards god that's why i say draw us and we will come after you draw us we are not pursuing you because somebody told us to we are being pulled towards you life will draw you so much and the more a man stays in god's presence the more the propensities of the flesh are mortified so what we call consecration is actually a love engagement that makes you hate every other and desires only him it is life that will bring you to true consecration when you come to a place where they reduce consecration to laws and discipline people will drift into secret sin so you will call you see you will come to church and act all pious but when you go out you know you are dying of lust you know you are dying of masturbation because you didn't give life access life is actually the cure to your quagmire but you first of all have to allow it grow until it becomes strong to dominate you when life dominates you the only thing that will be in your spirit will be hunger a test for god even when the church is not fasting you'll be fasting and then you'll be shocked that one man will fast more than the whole church that's why paul said i pray in tongue more than ye all how can one man pray more than the church It's hunger because he's not praying according to church calendar he's praying according to the laws of life that suppressed him so he has come under a government these are the dimensions of true Christianity that is no longer found. That's why we have too many fake men. We were not taught that Christianity is not about church. We were not taught that Christianity is not just about gathering. We were not taught that Christianity is not about title and place in church. So we deceive people to pursue after places. I am the choir director. I am prophet this. I am apostle this. But this prophet, apostle, this choir director, this, this media head, does not have a relationship with God he doesn't know when hunger woke him up from sleep to pray he doesn't know when hunger made him forget about dinner and he was with God he doesn't know when hunger drove him to a secret place and he prayed there until he became too late to come home 
because it's not about relationship we don't know through consecration and every time consecration is not in place a lot of things will go wrong but when true consecration begins it is the laws of life that binds you the second way he does it is by a burden in Mark 1 12 he said he was driven to the wilderness he didn't want to go there there was a burden that he could not deny it came upon him so heavy and he began to tame him if you understand true Christianity you will become like Mount Zion you will become like a fortress a fortress that nothing can break because you you will you will journey in the spirit the activities in your spirit will be too much for you to notice external activities something will be happening in your spirit it will be a rumbling it will be so heavy that you will not notice when a brother spoke against you today when somebody speaks against you you go and create a gang and then you sit down and you are strategizing you are where do you have such time? Where do you have such time? Today, we, we, when you see somebody doing well, you are looking for, you are full of envy. You want to kill yourself. How come? Why is it this person? How come you have so much time? What are the buttons that you carry? What are the things that drive you? It's so bad now that when you see people doing things, it's a reaction. Because A did it and succeeded. B too wants to do it. C too wants to do it. Instead of living, we are now reacting. Because there are no bodies. The weight of life is shallow. But when Jesus said, I am come. He didn't come to replace the things the devil took. No. If that was what Jesus came to do, it would have meant the devil was giving him assignment. The devil would have been sending him on an errand. He didn't come to replace the things the devil did. Jesus came to bring you into a world where the workings of the devil will count for nothing. Jesus came to introduce you to a realm and a dimension. You live in that dimension and everything the devil is doing counts for nothing. That's why I said the light shines in the darkness. The light doesn't even notice that darkness exists. He is too established in a dimension that darkness no longer counts. So what Jesus came to do was not to replace what the devil took. Jesus came to introduce you to a world. A world that brings you to a new civilization and make you become an extension of that world. So when you breathe, you bring that word to bear. When you speak, you bring that word to bear. Everything you do becomes an expression of that word. This is true Christianity. And when a man begins to live like this, he is actually begin to, beginning to grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Tonight, you will ask the Lord, Lord, give me another measure. Maybe the measure you have is not enough. The cares of this life have swallowed that measure. So because there's no house rent, you lose your prayer life. It's not your fault. The measure you have is not enough. Maybe the, the bitterness of people, the backbiting of people became too strong for your measure and it choked it. Maybe the iniquity of your environment. Everybody is fornicating. Everybody is lying. Everybody is doing yahoo yahoo. It has become so strong, it has choked you. Maybe the people living around you don't pray. They are just talking from morning to night and because you don't have enough measure instead of colonizing them they have colonized you you want to ask the lord this evening give me another measure give me another measure my goal this month is to show you the things that matter because if we begin to fly you miss why we came you won't know why we came you think we came to do what others are doing no we came to teach you the way of the spirit and if you were aligned with it you will mature in three months much more than you have grown in one year ask the lord tonight another measure give me another measure i know i'm a leader i know i'm a pastor i know that i'm popular people call me names but give me another measure give me another measure give me another measure the measure i have immorality crumbles it the measure i have but biting crumbles it the measure i have lies crumbles it give me another measure yeah.
persons is in church the quarrel and that quarrel in church is what chokes their life it's not even in the world do you know setting witchcraft is among brethren in church where we should come to absorb life that's where many met death do you know certain persons is in their offices that they died from the politics the backbiting choked them and they died do you know some persons is in their businesses there was not enough measure if you don't have enough measure your Christianity is religion because it's not about activities it's a business of life they say if you ask you will receive and if there's something I want you to ask tonight deliberately is to ask for more life there are too many things happening around you that wants to choke life out of you and for some of us we are already suffocating we got to pray we can't pray anymore we carry the Bible to read we slip off we can't read the scriptures because life is choked we are almost in the state of coma, spiritual coma. So you want to cry to the Lord, pour more life upon me. Release my life. Ask him for life. before now we are so strong that we saw visions before things happen we pick them it was so strong that even before someone calls you you know if somebody is at the gate you know if evil is by the corner you know but suddenly the life have depleted that your sensitivity went with it there are some of us here we carried so much life that when we spoke things happen but now even when we are shouting Nothing is going on anymore. Our activity level is increasing. Our tactics are increasing. But life is going down. You want to ask God for life? Say measures. 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 Measures.
Jesus. Amen. Do you know most of the things we are asking for? They are things that should be byproduct if we were growing in life. I remember those days when I was about five years, six years. I couldn't carry a bucket of water. If I attempt to carry it, I will throw the whole water away before I get to the house. Today, without praying, I can carry two buckets and I can run with it. It's not a prayer point. Our prayer points keep increasing because we don't grow in life. There are many things you shouldn't bother God about if you grow in life. Many things that God wants to give you, you can't handle them because you have not grown. You are troubling God every day. Lord, give me A, give me B. God is saying, grow is your inheritance. It is in growing that you enter. How come you are asking for the things that should be naturally yours? It's because growth is not in view. Activity is not replace it. There are many things if you just grow, they just happen naturally. When I was younger, my elder sisters, they will insist I wash my leg every evening. My leg was as black as a mechanic. No matter how I try to be neat, my leg must be dirty. Because we play football with football, with orange, with mango, everything. When we grew up, even if I don't shower till evening, my legs can be dirty. You are struggling with many sins because you have not grown up. When you grow, you will discover some of those sins you are saying, God, help me, help me. Life will choke it. Life will choke it. You will not need to pray. You have grown too much in life for evil parts to come. You have grown. That's what Christianity is about. Asking for matters tonight. Too many things have been withheld from you because you have not grown. Most of you are calling is hungry because you have not grown. Good man for the prophet. But when will you grow into the office? Enough, you are the person. When will you grow into the office? That's why life places the man. Ask him one more time. Withheld from you because you are making this intercession and petition tonight. The Lord is releasing that to you. Amen. The things that were withdrawn from you because you couldn't handle in the name of Jesus the Christ, receive it right now. Amen. Dimensions that were suspended from you because life has come to you. Step into those dimensions. Amen. Step into those dimensions. Amen. Traffic, blessings, callings that you are supposed to manifest. But as they walk back, because measures of life are not enough, right now, begin to walk in them. Amen. Begin to walk in them. Amen. Begin to walk in them. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hi. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm seeing the Lord restoring some people's altars, prayer altars, that have gone obsolete, that have become ashes. I'm seeing the work of the Spirit. They are groaning. 
They are groaning. The altars are being activated. name of Jesus if we go beyond this level I may puncture through some things and I'm sensing the restraint in my spirit I'm sensing the restraint I'm sensing the restraint the hand of God is heavy upon us now but I want you to go home with this body I'm trying so hard to cut contain myself so that I draw your attention to the things that matter. Ah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Some of you will go home tonight and you will pray till morning. Many restorations, many restorations will take place. Because what you lost was not money. What you lost was not your health. What you lost was not a relationship. It was a weight of life that departed. That's why your health was attacked. That's why money left. That's why relationships began to break. As life returns, you will discover that restorations will take place. Amen. Thank you, Father. 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 Somebody with a neck a neck challenge from somewhere here a neck challenge i've just been healed turn your neck and check somebody has just been healed listen mm. thank you father thank you father In the name of Jesus. Please lift your hands toward heaven. A day will come when we will begin to burn here. As you go home, everything you lost is restored. Everything the enemy took away from you is restored. In the name of Jesus. As you depart from here, all the requirements and the dictates of life that have departed from you is restored. There are some of you that have encounters in the spirit. There are some of you that journey in the place of prayer. There are some of you that, that you breathe by fasting. There are some of you that the word of God literally run through your spirit like a stream. But these things were withdrawn from today. All of those that you have lost, every spiritual dimension, every grace or attribute of the spirit that you walked in before now, that have been suspended in the name of Jesus, it is restored. Most of you will leave here and before the next meeting, you will say you laid hands on the sick, they recovered. Most of you will leave here and you will discover you will step into extraordinary favor because there was a favor that life provoked men gave you things freely but suddenly it stopped as you go back that weight of favor that has left your life is returned in the name of jesus amen every activity of the demonic that have lingered around you because of the new intensity and light that is coming to you those demons are banished in the name of jesus amen because the night cannot stop the sun from rising. 
Not at all. Nothing stops your blessing. Nothing stops your prosperity. Nothing stops your progress. In the name of Jesus. Most of you are shifting. You have been in one spot for too long. You are shifting by the spirit. You are shifting. There are new possibilities being allocated to you. New possibilities are being allocated to you. In the name of Jesus. I bless your health. I bless your home. I bless your finances. I bless your relationships. I decree that everything you do in righteousness prospers. In the name of Jesus. None of you will be weak. None of you will be small. The least of you will be counted for a great nation. In the name of Jesus. Those of you who are overseeing businesses, overseeing families, overseeing ministries, in the name of Jesus Christ, because it is connected to you, I decree that it begins to enlarge. It begins to enlarge. It begins to enlarge. A new altar of life comes upon it. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. There are many people that have walked under the weight of reproach because of the causes of their father's house, the causes of their ancestry. There are many people that have walked under the weight of indignation. I declare over you right now by the life of the Christos, in the name of Jesus, go forward and prosper and become exceeding great. Go forward and prosper and become exceeding great. Thank you, Father. I'm seeing something like a growth in somebody's throat. A growth in somebody's throat. It has just gone. You will check it and discover it has given you, you, you have had difficulty even in swallowing. That growth has just left you. If you are the person, can you wave at me? A growth just left. Something that has made somebody so uncomfortable. Can I, can I see that person? You may not need to come out. And I also saw that somebody has been healed. There was a neck condition. You couldn't turn. You have just been healed. Can you wave at me? Thank you, Lord. You have just been healed. I'm seeing, I'm seeing an anointing come on someone. I'm seeing an anointing fall on someone suddenly. Suddenly, it's a grace of speed. And this person will begin to prophesy. I'm seeing an anointing descend on someone. In the name of Jesus, take it. Take it. Thank you, Father. Just help them where they are. Ah, ah, ah. Somebody had a fractured ligament somewhere around the knee. It's like you had an accident and you've had this pain for a while. You can't, that leg creates, causes you so much discomfort. It looks like there's a, there was a fracture on the knee. You can check it now. You discover you have been healed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. As you go home, please. I told you it's not about your title. It's not about your position in church. It's a journey into the fullness of the measure of Christ. And God designed it this way. So that everybody will know it. And, and the Lord has procured every one of us because there is an assignment and there is an agenda that he has in mind. There is a purpose that he wants you to play a particular role in order for that purpose to be corporately achieved. This is why we gather together to equip ourselves from time to time with the word of the Lord 
to ensure that every one of us becomes eternally relevant in the agenda of God. And so tonight, I want to talk to us on the subject of spiritual maturity. And the pathway I want to route is the path of process. I want to talk to us about the classes in the school of process. Because for you to be mature in this kingdom, you must pass through definite spiritual processes that will refine you and equip you to come to that point where God can depend on you and entrust you with the kingdom. Maturity is a scary thing in the, skin, in the spirit. The reason is because maturity has to do with responsibility. You know, when I was a younger person, maybe a, a little lad, as simple as having my bath, I had to, they, they had to bait me and dress me up. But when I became mature, I had to take the responsibility of baiting myself. So there are many things God wants you to have. But there's a level you get to where God will no longer pamper you with those things. God will expect you to walk into those things. That's where maturity comes in. When you start walking with the Lord, you discover maybe some time ago when you were sick, somebody, God will send you somewhere or send somebody to pray for you and you'll be healed. Now you are becoming mature in the things of God and then you have as simple as headache. And then four or five people pray for you and you are not healed. And then you are wondering what's happening to the healing anointing. There's a level you are in your work with God where God will expect you to receive healing by the anointing of another person. And there's a level you get to God who wants you to exercise your faith. To enter not just into healing but divine health. Because at this point... He's not just interested in healing you. At this point, he wants to use you as a weapon of healing to fight against sickness in a territory. And if he continues to heal you by the anointing of others, you may never grow. So when you are sick, people pray for you, nothing happens. The Holy Ghost is directing you to a scripture. And then sometimes you sit on that scripture, you meditate on that scripture for a whole day, it will not work. I remember some years ago when I was on campus, I had this excruciating migraine. And everybody I believed in was anointed, prayed for me, and I would not get healed. So the Lord gave me a scripture. I meditated on the scripture until healing was not coming. I now heard the story of a woman that put the Bible in water and drank and got healed. So I took that page of scripture and I dipped it into water. I spoke in tongues and I drank it. Nothing happened. After a while, I had to go take paracetamol. <laughs> Because the headache was killing me. And then I told God, I will try again. I will try again. You know, and we continue the journey like that until a point comes where no matter what comes your way, you become like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. But these things don't happen overnight. You have to grow into it. I remember some years ago when everything I needed, I had to beg to get I had to beg for literally everything. And God wanted to train me on walking in abundance. And he told me to begin to give offering with 100 naira. And I was on campus. I think I was in 100 level. And I'm telling you, these were times when sometimes for two weeks, all I had was 100 naira. How do I start giving 100 naira, which is all I have sometimes in two weeks? And I have three services in a week. How do I survive? And the Lord will say, give me 100 naira. When I saw that it was heavy, when I want to go to church, what I do is the, the cloth where my money is, I will remove it and hang it somewhere and wear another cloth and go to church. Because I could not imagine how I would start giving 100 naira. It wasn't feasible. But God was teaching me a path. He was teaching me, taking me on a journey to come to a point where I will no longer ha have need for my personal things. What he wants to do with me will be global and transgenerational. And he will need me to come to a point where my faith will be able to abstract resources to a point where I can sponsor by the spirit global mandates and agendas, that agenda that was transgenerational. But it took a process. At first, you run away from it. When you come back to God, it will take you back to where you stopped. Sometimes you think God has forgotten it. Then you now come into a prayer meeting. And then they are praying, and then you go high in the spirit. When you go high in the spirit, then God will remind you where you and him stopped on the journey. 
you need to go back and start again because you can't jump classes here. If you will become what I want you to be, you must grow. And when you grow, you will discover that everything in this kingdom depends on growth. The moment you grow, you will now realize there are many dimensions of God that have been allocated to your destiny and to your life. But they are waiting for different phases of your maturity. If you get there, these things will begin to happen naturally. See where we are today. A day will come when the president of this country will come for our meeting. It's not a prayer point. It's a function of growth. A day will come when, before we come for meeting, people will be lined up in which years for us to finish the service and lay hands on them and they will walk. But now, if we like, we should do advertisement on every platform. They will not come. Because it doesn't take advertisement for these things to happen. It takes growth. <laughs> you may waste all your money on advertisement. Go to TBN. You will announce a healing service. At the end of the day, people will come and say, I had chest pain. It was gone. I had back pain. It was gone. You will not see one clutch or one wheelchair. They are waiting for you to grow. When you grow, the moment they hear you are in town, they will come on their own accord and they'll be waiting for you. These things are allocated to different dimensions. It takes growth to get there. So as a people and as individuals, we must pay the price to grow and it must be a conscious and deliberate thing to do. This is one of the greatest secrets in our kingdom work, that everything God has to offer is allocated to different phases of your growth process. And when you grow into those phases, those things become a byproduct. Jesus himself had to grow. Because there was a point in Jesus' life where they had to run with Jesus for him to survive. And an angel had to come in the night, take the child, Jesus, and run to Egypt. If not, he will die now. And if he dies now, there will be no salvation. And they packaged Jesus in the night and ran into Egypt with Jesus, the savior of the world. This is a man that salvation depended on. But salvation is not feasible until he grows. And when he grows, these things will become natural. John the Baptist had to grow. The Bible said in Luke chapter 1 verse 80, it said the child John grew in favor and in stature with God and with man. This is a child that Isaiah prophesied 800 years before he was born. 800 years, he said, I saw a voice crying in the wilderness, make a way for the Lord. And to make things palatable before he was born, the angel Gabriel stood in the temple and began to prophesy his birth. A child that was prophesied by a prophet, a cherubim had to come to announce his arrival. Nothing could happen with that child until he grew. Jesus, the son of God, in Luke 2.40, the Bible said he grew. He didn't just begin to walk in the fullness of his ordination because he's Jesus Christ. And if Jesus did not walk in the fullness of his ordination because he's Jesus Christ, you too must grow to walk in the fullness of your ordination. It's a burden in the heart of God that too many people that the weight of his kingdom depends on are not growing. And so these things affect the seasons and the calendar of God. Because there are many things God wants to do today. But it takes a quorum of mature believers to pay the price to bring those things down. And when it comes, our quorum are usually depleted because men are not growing. It's a body in the heart of God. So growth is a necessity and it's a must. Because too much depends on it. So we thank God for what he gives us. But we will not stop at just receiving. We will grow. He say, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The moment the son is given, he said, the government of this world shall be upon his shoulders. Everyone must grow in order to bear the government of the kingdom. You are not irrelevant in God's kingdom. If God is not doing great things with you yet, it's not because you are disadvantaged. It's probably because your maturity level has not come to that point where he can entrust you with those things. If you pay attention to growing without manipulation and canvassing for any form of support, these things will happen naturally. Even if there were warfare, you will still break through because growth will necessitate it. And so there are seven classes in the school of process that the Holy Ghost have taught me. And I want to share 
with us this evening, I hope we are able to exhaust it. But if we are not able to, wherever we stop, we will pray from there. You know, last week I wanted to share with us certain things that have to do with stature. But we were caught up in the middle. I pray that today I will teach for a while before the energy in my spirit becomes too high. The first class in the school of process, which is the journey of maturity, is the class of encounters. Christianity is not a theory. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is divinity manifested through human vessels. What will give stamina to your foundation and make you go through every phase of your development is the texture and the quality of encounter that you have. A man without encounters is a man that will not join in the kingdom. When you become a believer on the strength of stories, you will meet things that will undermine the stories you have heard. And you will come to that point where conviction will become the only tool that will keep you standing. But the depth of your conviction is a function of the nature of encounters that you have had. If you study through the scripture, you will discover every trailblazer in scripture began with an encounter. And the same applies in every facet of human endeavor. I was told and I have read before that life is a his history is the story of what leaders did and did not do. History has nothing to do with followers. It's always about leaders. And before a man comes to a point where he becomes the head of the arrow, there are encounters he will have that will make him journey through thick and thin in order to pass through the valley of death to manifest where there is abundance. Encounters are the deciding factor of the texture of a man's witness. When you read through scriptures, from Adam, the first man, his journey with God began with encounters. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, the Bible said, In the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden. And that voice was the one maturing Adam from one face to another. So Adam did not just appear in the garden and started being creative. Everything Adam represented at the level of his maturity and the strength of what he could do was a function of that voice that came in the cool of the day to speak to Adam. Without encounters, there can be no conviction. And without conviction, you cannot make the journey to the end. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, from verse 1 to 3, God wanted him to be the father of many nations. He wanted the whole children of the earth to be blessed by Abraham. But the only way he could activate that protocol of development was by encounter. He said, the Lord appeared to Abraham, and he said to him, Get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house and come to the land that I will show you. He said, in blessing, I will bless you. He said, all that bless you shall be blessed. All of this journey began with encounters. Without encounters, a man can journey. Christianity is not a story. Christianity is a reality that everyone walking in its fullness today know like he knows himself. It's too real to him that even if he intended to deny it, he can't because the encounters will make him a thousand times liar. When a man has encounters with God, it becomes difficult for him to deny his faith. No matter what he goes through, even if he laments, he can't deny it anymore. The encounters will become an imprint on the tablet of his heart. Those are the kind of men that can journey with God through the pathways of life and bring witness to the, the things of the spirit. When a man has no encounter, he can't journey far. I will emphasize this again and again because somebody will insist until he or she sustains an encounter potent enough to bear the weight of his destiny. In Exodus chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5, the Bible spoke about Moses. The man was burdened about Israel, but he took an encounter for that destiny to be activated. He said, and Moses kept the sheep of his father-in-law until he came to the backside of the desert, even Horeb, the mountain of God. And he said, there, he saw a bush burning that was not consumed. And he said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. That was where the journey of Moses' life began. Meanwhile, this man was already 40 years old. That means when it has to do with destiny, your chronological age is not a factor. It is the age where your encounter began that your destiny comes from. Because you begin to walk in the direction of that encounter. A 40-year-old man meant nothing in the agenda of God. 
But the moment the encounter began, the destiny journey began, and the scribes began to write. You will notice that when you read about Moses, there was nothing about him until he sustained this encounter. They only told us how he was drawn out of water and how he was the, 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 the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Nothing to be written, but the next 40 years after that encounter was littered with divine engagement that was so potent that a whole generation and a whole tribe of people was delivered. How come the second 40 years was too significant to be compared with the first? The divider was an encounter. The moment an encounter came, his life changed. Everything about him changed. He became a God among men. God himself called Moses a God. In Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he said, Behold, I have made Moses a God unto Pharaoh. When did Moses, who is also contending for the office of the Pharaoh, became a God to Pharaoh? Because an encounter made the difference. He became another man. If you study 1 Samuel chapter 3 from verse 1, the Bible told us in those days, it said the voice of God was cast. There were no open vision. No wonder Israel lost touch of. Israel became a slave among her enemies because encounters were lost. There were no open visions anymore. And suddenly in verse 4, God came calling a young boy. There were many experienced priests, priests, but they could not bring deliverance unto Jacob. It was a young lad that knew nothing that God started speaking to in the, in the temple. Samuel! And he said, here I am. He didn't know a journey had begun. And if you read verse 21 of that same scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Bible said the Lord appeared again to Samuel in Shiloh. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And in verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 3, he said it was known unto all Israel that God indeed had established Samuel as a prophet in Israel. What was the difference? It was an encounter. He didn't read the storybook. He met a spirit. And the moment he encountered that spirit, something changed about his life. I'm telling you how men become great in the kingdom. There are many things you will learn, but there is a sequence and there's a protocol that your life must follow after in order for you to be relevant. If you don't have an encounter, you will not even appreciate service. You won't know why you came. You will think you are helping somebody. But when you have an encounter, even where you are serving, you will know it's unto God because you will know you are in the school of process. The reason many times people are offended is because they've not had encounters. So when they are working in the house of God, they think they are supporting somebody. They think they are doing something for somebody. It will take an encounter to teach you the things that cannot be taught by writing. Those things will be ingrained in the tablet of your heart. Samuel! He said, here I am. And suddenly, a journey began in his life. These are trailblazers in the kingdom. We read the story of Gideon. The Bible said he was, he was, he was, he was, he was disenfranchised. And he felt so, so tired and angry. He was so offended at everything happening. All there was about Gideon's life was lamentation. If you say you are a God, why are we where we are? How come we have become slaves of the Midianite? Some of the things you are lamenting about, you think God will, will come and answer you in a classroom. <laughs> His name is called God. What that means is that he owes nobody no explanation. And when you get to eternity, you discover you are wrong. You know, some atheists will come and say, if God is God, why is this happening? Why is that happening? It was Ranghat Bonke that told us the story. When an atheist asked him, he now said, come. He went out and he saw a man with a bushy hair. He said, are there babas in this city? He said, yes. He said, if there are babas in this city, why is this man said bush? If God is real, why are all of these things happening? Because he's God. When you have the opportunity to question him, you will faint a thousand times. When you wake up, you will forget. That's when you realize you wasted your life. The guy was lamenting, and an angel appeared to him. In Judges chapter 6, from verse 11. And see the way the angel saluted him. Thou mighty man of valor. Me, mighty man of valor. Your greatness will be locked. It will take an encounter to unlock it. <laughs> you don't know that you are a deliverer. You sat down in fear when an encounter comes. Suddenly they will introduce you the way they know you in heaven. Because you came to act as a seed of eternity. And some of you today looking about, asking for direction. In heaven you are a prophet. You only came to earth and God dislocated from the possibilities of destiny. When an encounter comes, it will realign you to who you are from Zion. 
And when they looked at him, they said, you are not weak. You are not disadvantaged. Your salutation in the spirit is mighty man of valor. Could it be that you are supposed to be a healing evangelist and you are dying of sickness? Could it be that you are supposed to be a revivalist and you are dying in sin? It will take an encounter to open you up to the full weight of your ordination. Then you will begin to walk as a different man. You entered there differently, but you came out as a different man. Did you not read about Jesus? They knew him as a carpenter. But when he mounted the mountain, he came down. He was no longer a carpenter. Instantly, the salutation changed. A carpenter went to the mountain. After an encounter, he came down. They said, the land of Zabulu. The land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness, have seen a great light. What was the migration from carpenter to great light? It was a divide called an encounter. Somebody will receive an encounter that will change you from a beggar to a sustainer of nations. You are not too small for anything. It takes only an encounter to unlock you. And you'll be shocked that you who saved in 2021 from January to December and you ended up with 89,000. In the first three months of 2022, an encounter can come and you will know what to do. And in one month, you will become a millionaire. And they ask you, what happened? I encountered the spirit. The moment it happens, things change. This is why men must journey into maturity. But where it begins from, it's an encounter. Encounters will make a lot of difference in your life. In Jeremiah chapter 1 from verse 4 to 5, it says, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. You have the power to uproot kingdoms and to plant kingdoms. Meanwhile, the guy was being marginalized. He didn't know that he is somebody that can speak and a whole nation can be uprooted. What? Where is that authority hiding? It was hiding on his mountain of encounter. When the encounter comes, the man who is running away and looking for safety can suddenly command nations to be uprooted and it will be uprooted. And you wonder, what happened? Encounters. They are too important. Paul was a mighty apostle. But he didn't even know his left from his right. The church that he was designed to build was what he was fighting. Today, 14 out of the 27 books of the New Testament were written by Paul. Almost everything we know about foundational doctrines, Paul wrote them. Without the writings of Paul, the church will be depleted. Meanwhile, this guy was fighting the church, collecting letters and entering different cities to kill everybody that believed in the name of Jesus. How can a man be walking in a, in a wrong direction with so much zeal? I said before, I said, if you are in the wrong direction, speed is not an advantage. You are supposed to be going right and you are running on, a, on the speed of light towards the left. Every progress you make is a disadvantage. He took an encounter for him to be reoriented. And he realized that his energy and capacity was being, was being dissipated wrongly. Suddenly, Paul became one of the mightiest of the apostles. And in Galatians chapter 1, from verse 15, he said, When he pleased God to reveal his son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I went to Arabia. He said, the gospel that I preached, I wasn't taught of any man. It came to me from heaven. Encounters had redefined the life of Paul. Encounters had redefined the destiny of Paul. You may be a businessman because this has nothing to do with being a preacher. It has everything to do with your own line of destiny. You may be a businessman and you have been struggling. When you have an encounter, the level of wisdom and influence and favor you will tap into in one year, you will be amazed what you would achieve. And then you are wondering, were all of these possible? They were possible. But it took an encounter to take you there. And it's not just for male or for men. In Luke 135, like every other virgin in the city, Mary was also a virgin. But suddenly, an angel appeared to her and said, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And, he, and she said, he didn't have Jesus though. He now said, how shall these things be? Seeing that I know not a man. And the angel said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. See, many things about your destiny you are asking. How shall these things be? 
when an encounter comes, he said the Holy Ghost will overshadow you. God said you are going to be a governor and then you are asking, I don't know any politician. You don't need to know any politician. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, he will put favor on you so much so. Maybe you will just read a story and people will hear and say this is the next governor. The politicians you are laboring to find, they will begin to find you. Israel was in captivity for 430 years. And suddenly the Bible said God gave them favor before the Egyptians. And he said they spoiled the Egyptians. They took gold from Egypt. They became so wealthy. Why? Because something happened to them. A man that carried the counter appeared in their vicinity. And people that were slaves suddenly received favor. How can your own master come and say, take my possession? Something changed. And so every believer must pay the price to receive an encounter for destiny. When the worship is going on, it's not about the song. You may not know the song. But the Lord is traveling. The procession of the king is in that song. So forget about the kind of music you like and find the movement of the spirit. Because that may be the part of the service that will minister to you. It may be during the prayers. We take time here to pray for long so that the spirit of man will open. It's not just when the apostle comes up and is talking. The apostle may come up that day and he will not have the word of the Lord for you. The word of the Lord may be with the prayer man. And when the prayer is going on, God is throwing scriptures like bullets. That's when your encounter may come. And so when you are in the worship, your pursuit is to hit something in the spirit. Something that will minister to you and change the coordinates of your destiny and empower you to walk in the direction of the fullness of your destiny. This is the basic emphasis that we sustain when we gather together. That men will meet Jesus, not the preacher, not the singer, not the person praying. It is always about encounters. How many services have we attended without having a definite encounter? Maybe because we're distracted. When the prayer was going on, you say, Kai, wait, when would they start the word? And the word came in the prayer. When the worship was going on, you say, oh God, which songs are they singing like this? Where did they learn them from? At the, what tribe is that? <laughs> it's not about the kind of song. It's about the spirit that is powering the song. Now, for you to have an encounter, there is something you must sustain. We call it a body. So when a man wants to grow and want to enter the first class in the school of process, one thing he must master how to incubate is a body. Many people are bought bodies. When God put a body or a hunger in their spirit, they choke it. Some people come for a service Seven days ago, they were weeping because God was heavy upon them. The moment they leave that service, two hours later, everything dissipates. Because they didn't know that that thing that happened to them was to summon them to the presence where they will encounter God. The, the major spiritual ingredient that makes a man sustains encounter are the bodies that are on his spirit. Moses, the Bible said, he was in Egypt until he became dissatisfied. He was in Pharaoh's house. He was a prince. They betted him in the morning. Everything he needed was at his beck and call. But suddenly, a body crystallized on his soul. And he was no longer happy that the Israelites were in bondage. This body was the pathway to the encounter that would rewrite his story. He didn't understand how bodies work. Bodies don't provoke zeal. Bodies actually provoke intimacy. But when Moses received the body, he ran out of the house and started killing Egyptians. There are, there are millions of them. You can't kill all of them. And what you need to know is that even Egypt, God is interested in the men of Egypt. Because today there are many evangelists from Egypt. So if you slaughter the people, you are not doing the counsel of God. What that body necessitated Moses to do was to go and seek God and sustain strength and strategy on how to come deliver Israel. Many people have bodies instead of taking that body taking them to God's presence, the body moved them into activities. Bodies are not to provoke zeal for activities. Bodies are actually true bodies are designed to provoke hunger for God's presence. So when a man wants to begin his journey in destiny and growth, what God crystallizes on his soul are bodies, bodies that lead him to seek God and to find his face. The moment he presses and administers that body, 
a point will come when God will appear to him. Meanwhile, it's important for us to note that an encounter is not necessarily a light shining from the wall. No, that's not what we are saying. We are talking about the reality of God coming so heavy into your realm that you now interact with it experientially. And sometimes you will discover that this encounter may be God appearing to you. This encounter may be a scripture fired into your spirit and the scripture can't leave you anymore. This encounter may be a man sent to you to tell you something about your destiny and it resonates with your spirit. You know, the list I gave you earlier, you will discover that Adam's encounter was not with a person. The Bible said the voice of God came walking. Samuel's encounter was not with a person. It was the voice of God and the word of God. So encounters are not about a cloud appearing in the sky. Encounters about God making himself real to your heart. It can be by the instrumentality of a scripture. It can be by the instrumentality of a song. It can be an appearance of an angel. It can be an appearance of God. Whichever way God decides to route it, what encounters do is that he makes God and his realm become real to you. But what will make you to journey to that place where God can become real to you are bodies. You may go for a meeting and you receive a body for souls. You may go for a meeting and you receive a body for a territory. You may go for a meeting and you receive a body. Don't go and waste it on a movie. There are many times when you need to, don't just off the television, disconnect all the cables in your house, tie them and go and throw in your wardrobe so that somebody else cannot own it by mistake. There are seasons where you may need to off your phone and throw it away. There are seasons where you will cut off from some friends. You will cut off as if you bought it. You will off your phone or you will, you will put your phone on flight mode. The reason is because a burden has surrounded your spirit. And you know the atmosphere of a burden is a provoker of encounters. And burdens are like pregnancy. In the first trimester, if you want to be full of activity, you will miscarry. And because you don't want to miscarry, you will guide that burden jealously. People will look at you, they will think something is wrong. You are pregnant with something. It's called a body. God has put his hand heavy upon you and he will not let go until a strategy comes, until an encounter comes, until a word comes into your spirit. If a man can pay the price of securing and nurturing burdens, after a while, something will appear to him. And when that happens, he will build sufficient conviction and direction, strategy for destiny. It is as he walks through the path of destiny that he truly begins to grow. Because when you are joining in the path of destiny, you are not just maturing as a believer. You are also receiving the equipping necessary for your destiny. It will affect your, your menu. It will affect what you eat. It will affect what you drink. It will affect the company you keep. Did you read Judges chapter 13 when the angel appeared to, appeared to Manoah's wife? He said, from today you can't drink any strong drink. So even if that woman is your best friend, if you have an event and she happens to come there, she won't drink. They will say, no, 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 Kai. Our friendship, we have been friends for 30 years. It's not about how long we have been friends. I'm pregnant with something. And if she violates it, things will go wrong. So you don't just grow on this path by maturing as a believer. All the equipping for your destiny comes to you. When a man sustains an encounter, then he receives the first deposit of God. Actualizing his destiny. When this happens to you, then you go to the second class in the school of process. The second class in the school of process is a class of instructions. You know why God will give you instructions? Because if you take off without instructions, you will run away from the journey. He knows he has been there before. You know when God appeared to Moses, he had to calm him down first and give him definite instructions that will make him go and succeed. Because when you see the rot of Pharaoh, <laughs> you will run. God appears to you and say, go to Zanfara. You now say, the next thing you make a message. You say, no preacher is going to Zanfara, but where has come? <laughs> the first day you are approaching Zanfara, you will see that they beheaded seven preachers. That... You, you, you will start shaking. You will, go, you will run away in the night. You, I went to Mina for a meeting. And then they showed us an auditorium. The pastor didn't sell it. 
he packed his load and the load his wives his, his children packed all their luggages they ran from the city in the night he didn't bother to sell the church no anything that happens there should happen the man ran for his life because you don't know the vengeance that awaits you in eternity because when you say thy kingdom come it's a declaration of war because what you have done is that you are saying whatever kingdom it is that was existing here i uproot you and i bring a new one the keepers of that kingdom will not just smile at you they will fight you with darts and arrows they will fight you with a lot of weapons that if you are not careful you will discover you are not created enough for them you will need a lot of instruction to walk in safety as you prosecute destiny so when a man passes the class of encounter the next class god takes him to is the class of instruction in exodus chapter 13 verse 17 the bible says, when god delivered them from egypt he did not take them through the way of the philistine they say even though that was short he said he allowed them go through the way of the red sea because if they go through the way of the philistine they said they will meet war and they will run back god knows that without instruction you'll be vulnerable there are most of you here god told you he wants to raise you as a seer your eyes have not even opened yet you have printed a card that you are seer prophet a and b this the, the spirits will now say okay we heard the signal in the spirit that god wanted to raise a new prophet so you are the one they will come with cancer <laughs> meanwhile <laughs> you have not been equipped because the devil can perceive some things but he doesn't have exact information that's why when he came to the garden he said did god say so they are hearing that there's a new season in the spirit realm. god wants to raise new apostles god wants to they have not even ordained you as a dickie the next thing you appear online as apostle they will say okay this is one of them <laughs> and they will come with chisu <laughs> he said i want to raise metals i want somebody that will raise 12 billionaires you have not even asked him how you now appear and say the billionaire's mandate has been born they will now say so you are the one the next thing they will raise battles against you they may not even go out it's from church that they will kill you there are many doctrines we need now to deliver the body of christ some people started preaching it three years ago the doctrine is not wrong but the season have not come and the moment they preach it and they heard it pastor stood up with spare bows and arrow and shot them down today they are not even preaching the normal message again you need definite instructions that's where you learn patience from you will wake up in the night the anointing will be burning in your hand your hand will be shaking like this god will say wait you will come for a meeting the man is preaching you turn left you see an angel standing you are wondering why didn't the preacher see this angel somebody passes you are hearing everything about the person's name you are hearing the person's details you are moved to stop the person and say your name is matter i saw that last night you had a dream a demon appeared to you god said god will say keep quiet you will now be wondering why can't you die receive this anointing because if you jump you will die so god we want to equip you with instruction many people have genuine encounters but they didn't journey through the class of instruction they violated that class so from encounter they appeared in glory and in glory they are destroyed not even warfare it's in glory they appeared they are cut off because after encounter you must go through the class of instruction when you go through the class of instruction you will see the hand of god you know in isaiah chapter 48 from verse 21 he said they trusted not why he led them he cleaved the rock and he brought water for them and he said he spoke to the mountain he gushed out waters while you are following instruction god will allow you some mercy drop you will not lack but what you need to do is to keep your your your, your vessel and wait for matching orders because what god wants to do is mighty sometimes god puts a mantle on your life but the person who is handling that mantle is still alive and that mantle is the mantle of a gatekeeper you will be activated when the person leaves and god the person still has three years to go so you now wake up with a genuine encounter but the mantle has not yet been transferred you don't know that you have to travel with elijah and cross the jordan before the mantle will fall you are on the other side of jordan elijah is still alive he has not been taken and then you start proclaiming things you will die the 
That's why people don't mature. Some people die serving God. And they are wondering, Lord, are you not a just God anymore? God is just, but they violated process. They violated certain classes. And so because they violated those classes, they became casualties when principalities came into the game of war. Because they didn't know how to fight. God had not taught them enough, but they went into battlefield. When you have encounters, you will go through the school of instruction. In Psalm 119, from verse 97 to 104, David began to teach us. The advantage of going through the class of instruction. Can you project the scripture for us? He said, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all day. Next verse. It said, Thou through thy commandments has made thou through thy commandment has made me wiser than my enemies. You see what instructions do. Before your enemies plan, you are ahead of them. How did you get so wise? Through thy instructions, you have made me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. Go forward. He said, I have more understanding than my teachers. This is how we fight in the kingdom. The fathers of old, they fought the battle, they stopped at a level. I can assure you that we will know more than them. But they will go first. So there are many things that God will graduate us gradually. The reason is because, take for example, during their time, they were fighting poverty. So their heaviest doctrine was prosperity. They were fighting sickness. Their heaviest doctrine was healing and miracles. Now we are fighting terrorists. So beyond prosperity and healing, we must teach people by location and translocation. They don't know it. You see why I said, I'm wiser than my teachers. When we begin to teach about the glory land and by location, they may look at it and say, oh, this is not heresy. The reason is because we are fighting a different battle from their battles. Meanwhile, it would be wrong for you to now come and say, the fathers are wrong. They know nothing. They operated at the level of the battles that was allocated to them. When they came on the scene, there was poverty. There was sickness and death. So God equipped them with revelation for prosperity and healing. Now we have come on the scene. We will not leave what they have done. We will carry it along. That's why we honor them. Somebody said, you say you are a holiness preacher. You say you are a preacher of alignment. Why are you now endorsing those who preach prosperity? I say, well, I don't have the stature to endorse a father. That's number one. They are bigger than me. So if I mention a father, I'm not endorsing him because I don't have that stature. Number two, there's nothing wrong with prosperity. When we preach, we only stand against materialism. But the Bible said, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. Number two, Jesus said, give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed together, shaking together and running over. He said, the measure you give is the measure with which you will be given. So even Jesus preached prosperity. We have nothing against it. And so when we reference them, one, we are not endorsing them. They are the ones to endorse us. Number two, we will not dishonor them because we need what they carry. <laughs> have you not seen this man? They come for a meeting and they preach for God so love the world. And then you see cripples rising from which year? Cripples, 10, 20, rise in one service. We are preaching potters. We are seeing angels. Yet the cripples are not rising. Because it's not just revelation that makes it happen. It's a mantle. And if you dishonor them, you will not have that mantle. Your revelation will be correct, but you will struggle. This man stand. They are ministering to 100,000 people in one service. It's called impact. You have all the revelation. Sometimes you don't have 300 people in your service. Because these things are mantles. They are influences in the spirit. So no matter how accurate we think we are, we will still honor them. That's why when we call somebody's name, we don't say go and follow them. We only tell you this and this is how they blessed us. So it's honor and recognition to mantles. But we are also aware that what God wants to do is ahead of their dispensation. And so David is saying, through the instructions we secure through encounter, he says we are wiser than our teachers. You see where we go. Because if you don't have these encounters, no matter how you follow them, you will stop at their level. 
But the battles you will fight is beyond what they fought. Because some of them will soon go home. We will still be here for another 50 years. The days when God calls all of them back and we are the only people on the scene, if all we know is what they taught us, we are finished. Because aliens, I can tell you by revelation, aliens are coming into this world now. Aliens. We are not just fighting with men. I can tell you that gates are being opened in Hades. Some frogs are jumping out of hell, coming into earth. Princes of darkness are coming to bring directions of wickedness that men have not seen. Beyond just faith for healing and prosperity, we must have faith. Faith that even the fathers have never heard of. The day we come when a church in the place of worship, we leave the auditorium and go and worship somewhere else. We will journey to galactic dimensions and have fellowship because of what God will want us to do on the earth. A day will come when men will walk out of auditorium and you will see ancient patriarchs go out with them. And you are wondering, how did they come here? It's a dimension of fellowship. Maybe their own fellowship is about singing and dancing. And when they praise God, healings happen. Our own fellowship will be greater than singing and dancing. When we fellowship, we will experientially mingle with spirit of just man, not perfect. There are depths of fellowship will enter that they will not know. But it will take instruction to attain that level of wisdom in the spirit. That's why beyond the encounter, there are instructions that God wants to bring to you to open your hand. You know, David said, my God teaches my hands to fight and my fingers to war. He said, by my hand, I broke a bow of steel. You don't know what steel is. There is a dimension of strength that the guy entered because his fingers have been guided. It takes instruction to walk in superlative powers that the earth don't know. These are the secrets of God. That's why I said the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. He will show them his covenants. Hey, uh, uh -huh. <laughs>
service you, you won't understand what's happening. Somebody will be playing the keyboard and an angel will escape it. Just step aside. Because heavenly protector is about to invade the earth. They will excuse the victory. And when we watch it like this, the sound will leave the auditorium. Those who are in the bank, they will start hearing the worship in the bank. Those who are in the school will start hearing because it will be resonance effect. Then it will begin to merge. That's how we will take over the government. That's how we will take over the academia. That's how we will take over. We will not take over by human intelligence. There will be mystical, heavenly, and celestial dimension. That's what God is. The fraternity of man and immortal. You have been called into a fellowship that is eternal. It's not a joke. Where we are going is far. That's why we need to be taught. So we will know what we look for. My goal is not crowd. There are too many people gathering everywhere. I want to enter a meeting and come with angelic encourage. If I talk to 10 persons, they should scatter a city. They should take over a city. You, you leave a fellowship, the next day you go to work, people are falling under the power. Because of the energy that rested on you from that meeting. You leave a meeting, you go to the market, people are slaves. Not because you sang a song. A weight fell on you. That's what God is doing. Ah. Oh, my parents, they that time. Hey! In the name of Jesus. <laughs> if you enter the school of instruction, your life will be taken from you. That's when the culture of a spiritual man will be downloaded into your ecosystem. Sometimes God will tell you, you go to bed by 9, wake up by 3 a.m. and stand before me for four hours before you see the sun. It's not a doctrine. You have entered another school. That's how process is born. When you follow, see, when you follow the school of instruction, you download mantles. The man that wielded mantles, this is the school where they got it from. Sometimes the Lord will tell you, every day of this year, stand before me for 10 hours. And then you ask yourself, what else will I do? He will seize your life so that he can choke you with his own. And when you do it, the moment consistency is built, you will discover that a scepter will begin to form in the spirit. Those are the things we call mantles. Mantles are aggregation of spiritual instructions that were kept. And when you do it and it becomes a culture, then you have built a foundation enough to host a mantle. So when you see spiritual men, their weight is their consecration because instruction will turn them to aliens of this world. That's why you can't just follow a man and inherit his spirit. What makes that man will fall on you. And when it happens, you become a conduit. Even if the man doesn't like it, that thing will naturally flow through you. It's an instruction. This is a college where spiritual men are born. Spiritual men are not born just because they came to church. Spiritual men are not, just, are not born just because they had encounters. Spiritual men are born by instructions. Instructions hit them until the instruction will change their shape in the spirit. The instruction will 
we change their ecosystem. There are certain men God gives instruction. He say, don't talk to more than five people in a day. When the man does that for one year, even when he forgets the instruction, it becomes difficult for him to talk. Because his mouth is a scepter. Anything he utters is a law. Please sit down. Give me that sound. When God begins to bring a man to the college of instruction, that man is said to have known the ways of God. In Psalm 103, verse 7, the Bible said, God made known his ways unto Moses. You don't know the ways of his spirit until you have obeyed his instruction for a long time. When you obey his instruction for a long time, you now begin to identify patterns. Those patterns, you pick them after following instruction for a long time. You now discover... God told you to always wake up early. And then you did it for one month, for two months. You now realize that now that you wake up early, every time you step into a place, you arrest the atmosphere. You now know that standing before God early in the morning is a pattern for arresting atmospheres. Those things, you will find them when you follow aggregated instruction for a long time. And in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 6, Moses came to teach Israel one of the patterns. He said, this is what you must do. And he said, when you do it, the glory will appear. That means the glory of God don't come once in a while. The glory of God doesn't just appear because God felt like it. There is something you do that compels the glory to appear. Moses has fo had followed this spirit for too long for him to be misguided. He now understands patterns. Moses can tell you what you will do in the wilderness and the glory of God will appear visibly. Moses can tell you what you will do that rain will fall. Moses can tell you what you will do and he will take over a city. He has understood patterns because he has kept the instructions of this spirit for too long. When God wants to make you a spiritual man, he begins to traffic instructions in your direction. You are not a spiritual man because you are part of the church. You are a spiritual man because you receive divine instructions and you keep them. This is why Christianity is more personal than any other thing you know. Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Mm. So in this school, scepters are given. Authorities are granted. Spiritual cultures are built. And the ways of God are understood. This is where true spiritual men are born. For you to survive in this school. You know, I told you, for you to survive in the school of encounters, you must know how to nurture bodies. For you to survive in the school of instruction, you must sustain a childlike heart. Because God will break you. Those instructions will break you a thousand times. If you have not come to that point where you maintain a childlike heart, you can't pass this college. You will still be strong in your own ways. 
he will not be strong in you. For you to pass the school of encounters, you must become a master of nurturing bodies. For you to master or sustain the school of instruction, you must build a childlike heart. So, you don't know anything. It's what God tells you that you do. That's why I say a spiritual man is mad. You can come for a service and God say, don't talk. They will pray and go home. You will be afraid in your heart. Lord, if I don't talk today, will the people come tomorrow? It's not about the people. Don't talk. Meanwhile, that day that you didn't talk, the people will be blessed much more than all the days you have been talking. Because he's the one that convicts the heart of men. It's not your English language. You are mighty on your throne. Classes in the school of process. I'm teaching this, you begin to check to find out where you are. Some of us have not even had any encounters to build any conviction in life. We are just looking for the easy way out. Ha! Huh, you will not go far. And for some of us, we have violated loads of instruction. Even me talking to you, some of the instructions God gave me, I'm still praying for him to help me. Meanwhile, my, my, my next level manifestation depends on them. God told me to pray for 10 hours every day. When I check my schedule, I say, is it two times a week? Is it three times in a week? Every day. How do they do that? Every day. If it's four times a week, we can understand. Every day. The Lord told me, only drink hot water. Those who are close to me know. Me, I'm an, I'm an, I'm addicted to cold water. When I drink, I do. <clears throat> you now come and hot water doesn't have taste in my mouth. How do I survive? Because there are many places. There are some sounds I hear in the spirit. I need a high pitch to crescendo into those sounds. Because there are glories I can't download, but the voice can't go far. Is it drink hot water? Meanwhile, he will be waiting until you obey. And if you don't, after a while, he will bring somebody else to replace you. So what I'm teaching you, this is how men grow. You violate instructions, you are in trouble. They are scepters that are waiting. God wants you to enter the north and disarm the, the sons of, of the bondwoman. And the simple instructions he gave you, you can't keep them. And then we are wondering, Lord, when will you bring, bring deliverance? We will pray around the country, but God is waiting for the men that can wield scepters. Because those scepters are the instruments of war. The third class in the school of process is the class of service. I want to reach at least five. That's why I'm... I'm, I'm gathering myself, trying to curtail. I know we love power. We love intense atmosphere. But please, take these instructions. Go home with them. Your life will so change. You will be amazed. The school of service. The school of encounter is the school of enrollment. enrollment. That's when you are recruited into the army of God. The school of instruction is a class of wisdom and empowerment. The school of service is the school of securing divine inheritance or heritage. If you don't serve in this kingdom, there's no heritage for you. You may be anointed, but you'll discover that spiritual heritage is different from an anointing. There are many people today who are raising the dead every day. Nobody knows them. God can't entrust them to deal with governmental issues. God can't entrust them to transform life. They are highly anointed. But when they look around the body of Christ, nobody was qualified to serve. They look at this place, they list seven errors. They come here, they list 13 errors. They come here, they list nine errors. 
Everybody have errors. They are the only right people. And because they are the only right people, they now remain in the cave and raise dead men there. Meanwhile, what God wants to do with them needs to be transgenerational. But they cannot receive inheritance and they can't transfer. Because they didn't allow room for service. Jesus himself taught, he said, in this kingdom, the greatest is the servant of all. Spiritual heritage is only allocated to those who serve. In Genesis 27 verse 4, here was Isaac wanting to bless his son. Why wouldn't you just bless the young man? He said, go and get for me a savory venison. Let me eat that my soul will bless you. Service provoke the release of inheritance. And that's why when you are in a system, don't join politicians. Don't come to church and do politics. There's too much politics and gimmicks in the church today. Backbiting, hatred, malice, selfishness, because people can't pay the price to serve and receive something. And because they can't pay the price, they want to use politics, sentiment to rise. Even if they give you the whole platform, if you don't have an inheritance, it will dry up. And the man who has an inheritance, send him to the wilderness. That wilderness will become a fruitful field. And the fruitful field will become a forest. Because it's not platform that makes men. It's God that makes men. And one of the things God sees to make a man is the texture of his heart in the place of service. When you serve, it gives God an opportunity to verify the quality of your heart. Because you can come to him and cry, he will not be moved. He say, I the Lord, I try the heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 10. I test the rage to give to every man as his way should be. And the way God tests the heart of people is when they are serving. Don't be that Christian that serves nobody. And you say, no, God is our father. These structures are put in place by God himself. He said, without every contradiction, Hebrews 7, 7, the less is blessed of the better. There are many men that have encountered Jesus today. He sent them to meet men. He said concerning Joshua, he said, Joshua is the servant of Moses. He said, Aaron is Moses' prophet. Today you serve people and then mentors on Facebook will come and sit down with a big Bible that they don't read and start telling you and planting rebellion in the heart of young people who don't understand kingdom systems. You don't serve, how do you lead? I can tell you many promotions I received while serving. Not while reading the Bible or meditating on scriptures. When I was serving in Christ Embassy 10 years ago, we bought Bibles and sent to India at the instruction of God's servant. We went into football field. When we have sell day, we buy footballs with our money. Take to the field, give the people to invite them to church, hoping that some of them will give their heart to Christ on Sunday. We bought rhapsodies, put it. I, I served 12 years ago. All my NYC allowance, I gave it as partnership. When we came back, an instruction came from headquarters. That every leader should go through foundation school again. I was a foundation school instructor. When we went to foundation school, on the day of graduation, our pastor forgot to submit my record. I had invited all my family members. I prayed for the PA to the governor. He was healed of back pain. All these dignitaries came to church, hoping to see the man of God shine. When they gave all the awards, my name was not mentioned. I almost fainted. My heart, it looked as if they, they hit my heart with an axe. At first, my, my eyeballs became heavy. I couldn't turn like this anymore. <laughs> All my family members were there. I, suddenly, I discovered I wanted to turn. I couldn't turn. My eyeballs became heavy. I was sweating profusely. The whole suit was wet. Meanwhile, we were wearing academic gown, sitting in front. They called everybody, collected certificates, they forgot me. What? When I woke up, I came out with anger. The anger could cook yam and beans. Ooh. The Holy
Holy Ghost now told me, all the money you have in your pocket, go and give it to your pastor as if. That was when tears dropped from my eye. Tears, tears. The tears just rolled down. When I went to give the seed, the senior pastor now said, ah, what happened? That was when they discovered they forgot my name. He said, don't worry, the evening will honor you. Senior pastor came with wisdom to manage the situation, but my heart had been chiseled. God knew there was a desire for show in my heart. So it wasn't about the souls. It was about inviting me as the best graduating student, and I will walk like Pastor Chris. God saw all of that and discovered this man is a showman. So they deliberately removed me. He dealt with my heart. This college, what it does is that it chisels your heart and reorder it so that your priorities will be right. <laughs> Don't think people are doing what they are doing because they are quoting scriptures. There's a record of service. Their heart has been tried. So God can entrust them with things. Powers can be entrusted to them. You will preach better than them, but God gives them fame. And then you think fame is about going on YouTube. No. Facebook don't make men popular. It's a blast of a trumpet from heaven. This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. He, he, he. It's a man whose heart has been tried. Most times when they invite us for service, we are waiting for hand clap. It won't take you anywhere. The, the scribes will be checking you in the secret to find out. And when your service is wrong, they will create situations that will make the thing affect your heart. I can tell you stories upon stories. The last place where I sat, I was teaching in the Bible school. On the 12th of March, 2017, my brother that I lived with, mentored me for 10 years, took ill, and we rushed him to the, the hospital. That was a Sunday morning. I was to teach in the Bible school on Monday. And the Bible school is such that you teach from 8 to 3 p.m. From Monday to Thursday. And then Saturday, Friday you teach from 12 to 6. Saturday you teach from morning to evening. On Monday morning, my brother fell into coma. They connected Tatika, or what do they call it? For Tatika for urinating, connected a pipe through his nose to feed him. I had to go to teach in the Bible school. I wasn't looking for the apostle to say, well done. I was teaching in that Bible school from Monday to Friday. Saturday, 3 p.m. on the 18th, he died. My impartation session was on Sunday. I still went there for the impartation service. When I was talking to them, I was crying. The people thought I was under the glory. You just wake up. You think people appear. We don't appear. That's why we don't have time for politics. When you serve, the jealousy of God will say to you, even if the whole world turn against you, you have paid your due. When we wanted to start this work, some people said that me, I fraternize with a prophet, and the prophet is the one sponsoring the work. I looked at them and laughed. I said, I'm not a novice. No man can sponsor God's work. There's no prophet in any part of the world that gave me one dollar. I don't need a prophet to do what God sent me to do. If God can't sponsor it, then I won't do it. We paid our price. When we served, we served with a perfect heart. I don't need to meet any mortar. There is no human being on earth that I ask for one dollar. When we started and the thing was booming, some people came and said that I started two years ago and he did and then came back. Look at all my leaders. They all met me in December. The only person that knows me before now is Victor, my wife. When you want to do what God sent you to do, hell will break loose. That's why, why God gives you the opportunity to serve. Give your all. So that in the day of manifestation, you will live with an inheritance. No matter what happens, there will be a heritage for you. Service is God's strategy of giving an inheritance to a generation. There are too many people not serving. Nobody just appear. Everyone you see great, see doing great thing. There were times when they serve, and service is where you will be humbled. Sometimes you do your best, they come and rebuke you, and then you are wondering, but can't this person see that we're here for seven hours? 
Is it because the sound went up that we are being built? God is giving you an opportunity to texture your heart because he knows there is a delicate imbalance of pride that will ruin you of destiny. He knows there is fear. So many things, garbages in your heart, God knows. And so God will tamper with your heart in the place of service so that he will texture it, refine it enough to host his glory. All of these are not palatable, but this is how God forges his warriors. And when he shows them to a generation, they come with mantles of different flavor. Since 2019, I went to University of Ibadan to preach. And after preaching, powerful service, three sessions. There were miracles in the morning. We lost count. And when I wanted to go, the students escorted me to the car and said, God bless you, sir. Well, I was hoping they would give me my honorarium. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. I won't end again. I entered the car when I drove off. I carried my phone to call the president. What, what is going on here? The Holy Ghost now told me from today, don't take honorarium from students. Meanwhile, 70% of my meetings were on campuses. Don't take honorarium. What, is it? what, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm trying to understand. What, what, what is the meaning of that? Please help me, Lord, to have understanding. I know you are an immortal. I don't know what you are saying. What does it mean? Not, don't take on radio. Sorry, sir. What do you mean by that? <laughs> to make things work, God, worse, God, God began to open some little doors for me. And then senior ministers will invite me, fathers will invite me. When I come and preach, I want to leave. God will now say, don't take on radio. Let them bless you. For two years, we were like wanderers. Meanwhile, it's inside these two years that I wanted to marry. I say, are you about commanding rabbins to bring bread? Because I don't know what I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. No prophetic word of consolation. But if you don't die to money, a day will come, the princes will bargain your ministry with money. So there are many things it does in your heart. It's in the school of service that God has the opportunity to travel deep into your soul. He will give you instructions that will look unbearable. Don't worry. You are learning how to be perfected to bring an acceptable offering to God. And if these things happen to you when you are young, thank God. We we'll follow this path like the path of the eagle. And we kept growing with God when we were about pioneering this work. I told them, don't worry, everything will be provided. We had budgets in millions. Millions. It's not a joke. When you see sound and light like this, it's not prayer that brought it. It's money that brought it. Budgets in millions. What do we do? And you know, God, I can't sponsor ministry. You have to do it. The morning of the inauguration, I was invited to preach somewhere by one of the mothers of the land. I said, no, I, can't, I don't preach on my inaugural service. Why would I do that? He said, do it for honor. I said, okay, I will go for honor's sake. I went to preach. When I finished preaching, two services, woman of God came up. Mothers, I, I'm beginning to suspect that mothers are better than fathers. <laughs> I'm, I'm just suspecting. I think there's a motherly dimension of God that the Bible didn't capture. Mothers are better. Mama, thank you. I think that's the Holy Spirit. Mama came up and prayed for me, laid hands on me, and the next thing she said, let's bless this young man. He's about to start a walk. I was so ashamed. I said, no, 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 that's not why I came. Please, let's bless this man. Ah! I didn't know what, it looks as if the ground should open for me to enter. When I came out, they gave me honorarium. I said, I don't take honorarium from fathers. We fought until they threw the money the inside my, motor, my car. Meanwhile, somebody who just came to the service was blessed. He wrote a check of one million. He said, he blessed me. They gave me two million for honorarium. When I left service, mama sent one million. 
After 24 hours, the money they gather, they send seven point something million. From one service, I came with 14 million. Meanwhile, some people came and said, I was asking for money. I said, I know God. I didn't appear here. I grew to this place. I know how God works. God sponsors his assignment. One service. I didn't say I, do, I did three days in a conference. One morning service. I came back with 14 million. That's over $28,000. Because when you serve God, the jealousy of God will reward you. He has checked your heart and he has seen that what you are looking for is more money. So the things people pray for, you will discover without praying, they happen to you naturally. I came back, I said, what do you need? Okay, buy this, buy that, buy that. I was talking like a king. <laughs> Many years of service were speaking. When you are serving, it will become the reason why you will step into rest in your family. People are crying, there's no food. If there's no food, ravens will bring you bread. You won't know how. But the God you serve in secret, his jealousy will defend you in the open. This is, this is what they should teach believers. It's not just come and prophesy over you. You are blessed. This week you are blessed. Those things are good. But there's a realm of dominion God wants to bring you into. For you to walk in that dominion is service that will take you there. Most of us have absconded from service because it was difficult. It is in the difficult ground that your heart is tested. Don't just enjoy service when it's simple. When they say, come and lead, lead praise or lead worship because you are ministering to people, you are serving with all your heart. A day will come, they'll tell you to go and wash the toilet. Don't enjoy the one on the altar more than the one behind because it's the one that is difficult that God uses to veto your conscience and your heart. And when he checks your heart, your reward system will be directly proportional to the texture of your heart because the things that come out of your heart they are aromas to the heavens when we talk process we say it passionately because this is where strong men are born and if there are no strong men God will suffer in a generation there will be too much gap and the enemy will have too much harvest your destiny is too big you can't take the risk of not serving before you appear. There are too many battles. There are too many dark places that hurt your rising. You didn't do anything for it. You didn't offend anybody. But the wickedness of man and spirit will bring you into a battle you never planned for. But the services you render years before you came to the battlefield will rise up as a defense. When you serve, many systems are open to you. One is called the system of faithfulness. The system of faithfulness is what gives God the excuse to reward you and to bless you more than you deserve. The law may be that when you give, it's giving back to you. And the measure with which you give is what you will receive. But because you were faithful, God will go beyond the law. Because faithfulness is an excuse that God has to reward a man and to bless him beyond his faith. The second system you learn in service is humility. Humility is what gives you favor with God and with man. They say, I resist the proud, but I give more grace to the humble. There are many things God wants you to do that your faith can't carry. But in service, if humility it becomes part of your garment, you will discover that much more than you deserve. You will enter a city, people just love you. And people are just blessing you. You are wondering, why? Your humility is an alarm system. Help this man. Bless this man. Increase this man. He said, by humility, more grace is granted to a man. The third system you enter is honor. Because when you serve people and serve God, you are honoring them. And what honor does for you is that it allows you a legal license to spend from another man's resource. And so sometimes because you serve the man, God will take his honor and put on your life. Did you not read about, about Joshua? He said, I will take the honor that is upon Moses and I will put on your life. When men see you, they will see you in the stature of that man. You do what everybody else is doing, but they are responding to you like that man. Imagine if you are a pastor in living faith. 
and then you come to a place they receive you as Bishop Oedipo. It's a system of honor. It allows you to spend from the economy of another man. And then the last is the system of cheerfulness. Cheerfulness brings you into rest. Because cheerfulness is a dimension of joy. And joy is strength. Say the joy of the Lord is my strength. You come into rest. All of these allocations are procured in service. When you master the class of service, then you enter the fourth class. It's the class of self-denial. Wait, what's the time? Ah! We're out of time. Oh, Jesus Christ. Hmm. The school of process. I wanted to ascend in the fifth class. Because after the class of self-denial, you now come into the class of warfare. If you don't fight in this kingdom, you can't be a ruler. In this kingdom, we fight. What truly establishes a man are the battles and the conquest that he has to his name. It is the credit of warfare that makes you a force in this kingdom. Everything you learn will count for nothing until you have fought the battles of Elohim. There are many battles God will introduce you to. When you fight those wars, you become a captain, a champion in the arena of God. When you master the class of battle, then you enter the class of glory. In the class of glory, you rest. Anything you say happens. Have you seen men that some of the things you fasted for for one year, they crossed their leg. I was in Uma of Pais meeting. And they said, Lord, now I'm top 400 people. And people were dropping like mango, mango fruit. While I was looking in bewilderment, he didn't stop there. He now punished me for that. He said, the reason I give numbers is so that we can manage it. If I want power to move in a meeting, sometimes I have to ascend with prayer or ascend in worship. Or utterance must be given to me. A man came, he just crossed his leg, put his hand on the pulpit, and said 400 people. And he didn't stop there. He sounded proud, but that's a man walking in glory. It's the class where he is that determines the authority level he commands. God is looking for men, but the kind of men God uses or uses are the men that he has been processed. They have been processed, they don't appear. They are made. They say, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. Men don't appear. Men are made. They are forged. And the furnace that forges men is the school of process. I was teaching you last week and I told you how that intercession alone, if God allows you to journey through the corridor of prayer, there's a point you come, you become... I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed if um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description call us and let us lead you to receive jesus christ as your lord and personal savior and lastly make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded you can be notified thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section bye